Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stephen, for the very kind introduction. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wong, for inviting me uh, again to share uh, our experiences and, and, and uh, also discussion and talk on prostate cancer. I think this is um, a really a changing area, an exciting new area in development. So there are a few uh, new changes and, uh, and I hope I can uh, uh, highlight this to the audience. Okay, let me start my talk now. Uh, this is, you know, we always start our talk with a little bit of statistics. You see that cancer, prost uh, cancer uh, prostate cancer in, in Malaysia is, is one of the top five cancers. Um, we see an average of about 800 to uh, 900 uh, patients a year following our NSR, um, uh, our NCR registry. Okay. Uh, in the United States uh, and Europe, the number of prostate cancers are very, very high compared to our region. Um, in, in the Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, it's very low. But unfortunately, if you see that little red line, that's the mortality um, death uh, rate from prostate cancer, it is pretty high. Now, cancer of the prostate, we know, is an aging disease. As we get older, we get higher and higher number of uh, cases of uh, prostate cancer. Um, so it, it starts to shoot up really above uh, uh, 50, 55 years old. Okay, now this is the stat part about our statistics. We, we see, in, in this is the Malaysian statistics, we see a high percentage of patients presenting with stage four disease. Uh, and, and you know, so, so we hope through education awareness, uh, we can cut down this. We've been very, very successful in breast cancer where all this early detection, early screening, we've managed to change the curve uh, from stage uh, and lower the stage four numbers. And I hope that one day through all these, all these ex ex campaign, we can cut down the number of stage four cancers that we see and, and, and make it, uh, uh, you know, so that we, uh, uh, through early detection and, and program uh, and screening, we can detect earlier stages. Okay, uh, I don't think I need to educate, but just to serve, because some people ask me, where is the prostate gland? This is the prostate gland. It's a, it's a small gland, size of a walnut. It is very close to the bladder and, and the rectum. And prostate cancer is one of the commonest cancers that affects men. Uh, prostate gland, prostate is the gland in the male reproductive organ, and it starts, and the cancer starts there. It's a slow growing initially, and it may remain restricted um, to the prostate. So patients may not be, may not have any symptoms as when during early stages, um, because it doesn't cause much problem. Uh, so sometimes you can detect it through blood test PSA. And, and some men are not even, they don't even know that they have cancer. Um, and some patients, even uh, in, in UK, at, at, uh, they found that quite a high percentage of elderly patients uh, during a biopsy was found to have uh, uh, prostate cancer, but didn't, you know, they didn't die from it. Early symptoms, like I said, you will not find much symptoms uh, unless it starts to spread. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, patients may complain of urinary problems. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much about this because I think Dr. Tay will be talking to us on this. Uh, advancing symptoms uh, uh, will change or increase as the prostate advances and, and patients with advanced symptoms may have uh, problems with pain, discomfort, fatigue, uh, uh, swelling, uh, Sometimes when the cancer spreads to the bone, it can cause something called spinal cord compression and may result in weakness and paralysis in the limbs. 
early detection, again, this will be covered by, I think, uh, mainly by uh, through blood or examination uh, or, or both. And screening is, is important, although uh, it doesn't, may not help patients uh, or to live any uh, much longer. Uh, but early detection, um, uh, although it's very, very important. Yeah. And it can be diagnosed by, like I say, rectal examination, blood scans, PET scans. We do have gallium PSME for staging. And, and the most important thing is to do a prostate biopsy. And, and we stage prostate cancer, stage one, two, three, and four. Stage uh, the early one and two being very localized. Stage four, cancer has uh, spread to many organs, uh, mainly in the bone. Um, and, and sometimes to the liver and lung. And we also classify after biopsy, uh, we can classify and, and scan, we can classify the patient into low, uh, intermediate and high risk. And this is just a simple classification uh, for treatment purposes to uh, uh, separate patients, low, intermediate and high risk. Okay. Uh, what are the treatment options for prostate cancer? Well, it really depends on the stage, the PSA level, Gleason score, thickness level. Um, you know, some patients may opt for just uh, active surveillance uh, with regular monitoring, uh, especially in very uh, elderly patients, uh, or just watchful of observation uh, where the monitoring is uh, less intensive. Uh, if they need treatment, there are sur surgical option, uh, radiotherapy option. Uh, and also uh, for late stages of uh, treatment with uh, chemo, hormonal, or targeted therapy. So in the radiotherapy uh, uh, option, we have various new techniques of uh, radiation treatment. Okay, Just to remind again about the, the anatomy of the prostate gland, which sits here, and there is a, a nerve that just goes behind it, and then there's the rectum there, bladder is here. So when we talk about treatment, uh, sometimes we injure the nerve and this can cause uh, problems with uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. Now, what is radiotherapy? Uh, some of you have already heard some of uh, my talk earlier. Uh, there might be a little bit of repetition. Um, radiation therapy uses high energy of X-ray. So high energy of X-ray or particles that are focused to kill the cancer cells. How radiation kills cancer cells is it damages the DNA. When it damages the DNA, it breaks the DNA strand and the DNA cannot repair itself. And thus, therefore, the cell cannot replicate. When the cells cannot replicate, the cells die. So radiation is... Uh, just very, very focused, very localized treatment. And it can be given uh, mainly as primary treatment. Um, and the cure rates for men receiving radiotherapy are uh, all treated with uh, radical radiotherapy. Uh, re results are almost uh, equal. Uh, the only difference is in terms of mobility, side effects. Uh, each modality of treatment, surgery and radiation have its own um, side effects and uh, complications. Okay. Uh, it can be given with hormonal therapy for high-risk patients or locally advanced uh, prostate cancer patients. Uh, radiotherapy can be given if, let's say, a uh, patient undergoes surgery and the surgical margin is not clean and there is tumor at the edge. And it can, that means we have a positive surgical margin. So it can be used to control the disease and prevent relapse. For, for patients with positive surgical margins. Now, patients with advanced cancer, uh, where the cancer has spread, the role of radiation is really palliative. Palliative means we provide symptom relief. Say, for example, uh, treatment of bone metastasis. They have very severe bone pain, and the cancer is eroding into the spine or into the uh, uh, bone. Uh, we can give radiation. Uh, as a palliative treatment to control bone pain. And these are generally quite effective. It takes about uh, uh, five days uh, to treat these patients. And they generally, 80% get pain relief 
within two to four weeks. So it's very, very effective form of radiation. Sometimes uh, when there's severe bleeding, we can use uh, radiation uh, to stop the bleed as well. Okay, and like I say, the treatment outcome, cure rates for radical prostatectomy and, and, and surgery uh, is, is, is comparable. Now, what are the types of radiation therapy? Well, we have um, um, uh, Mr. Chris, uh, Stephen Kong just now mentioned that he, uh, uh, he started, I started the radiotherapy unit uh, at University oh. Hospital. In those days, we, we brought in a, a, a new technology a linear accelerator with a multi-leaf collimator. And so we started doing 3D conformal radiotherapy in 1997 at University Hospital. So, so we could shape. 3D conformal means we try to conform to the shape of the organ that we are treating so that there will be less spill to the uh, tissue surrounding it. So this will limit treatment-related uh, compli complication. So as the radio technology and computer technology uh, advanced, uh, we, when we moved on from 3D conformal radiotherapy to something called intensity modulated radiotherapy or also VMAT or volume modulated uh, arc therapy. And then again, another step in technology is SBRT or stereotactic body radiotherapy where the treatment is even more precise and we give big, big doses in a very short period of time. Image guidance radiation therapy is just imaging uh, technology that we use when you are treating patients. As you know, prostate can move uh, uh, with bowel or rectal filling. So we need to detect that movement so that we know that we are, the treatment always includes the prostate in the treatment field. And if the prostate moves away from the treatment field, um, we need somehow to stop uh, the treatment. Otherwise, uh, we'll be treating a lot of good tissues. So, so uh, image guidance is, is, is very, very important. Um, okay. um, proton therapy, I'm not going to touch on proton therapy. Uh, we don't have any proton machines in Malaysia. The nearest is India and Taiwan. Proton therapy is very, very expensive. It costs over a hundred, a hundred million ringgit just to buy a, a, a simple proton unit, and and it can cost a lot more for a more uh, a complicated multi, uh, multiple gantry uh, uh, machine. So it's it's you know and and, and I'm not going to touch on that. And of course, we do have uh, internal radiation or implants. Okay, these are the two machines that we have in Beacon Hospital. Uh, the True Beam and the Halcyon, uh, we replace our our uh, these two machines have replaced our Cybernite, uh, which I, I used to treat uh, use for SBRT using SBRT technology, and it's actually quite a nice, wonderful machine. Uh, but we have a more uh, updated, so I treat my SBRT using uh, my True Beam. Um, it's very very fast, a uh, very very fast machine. If these two machines replace one, only a Okay, sorry. So, in Beacon Hospital, we've been treating uh, prostate cancer with all this cutting edge technology using IMRT, VMAT, uh, IGRT, uh, and SBRT. And we've actually been using uh, SBRT for the last 15 years. And we've got a, over 2,000 patient experience using SRT and SBRT. And over 100 patients. Uh, or, or using SBRT for prostate cancer. Now, what is the key things about prostate cancer? Is here, this is the prostate here. This is the bladder. This is the rectum. This is so-called our radiation zone. The more focused our radiation zone, the smaller the radiation do zone. The collateral damage to the bladder and the rectum and even to the nerve gets less. So, so you know, so technology plays an important role uh, in, in, um, in, in uh, limiting the side effects or morbidity of treatment. Now, how do I summarize 
all these different technology, I'll just do it in a simple graph so that it's uh, very easy to understand. So we can talk about SBRT, IMRT, conformal radiotherapy, conventional radiotherapy. What does it all mean? When we started with conformal or conventional radiotherapy, we treat the front and back. Our treatment volume was huge. It was very big because we, we, we you know, included a lot of st structures. Uh, sometimes even in those days, we started treating pelvic nodes prophylactically. But as we learn um, how to use radiation better, we cut down our volume and conformal radiotherapy, uh, we try to conform to the shape of the uh, uh, prostate, but we have to give some margin because some margin because of prostate movement. So we still treat, there is still spillover to some um, good organs. And, and IMRT is a little bit tighter than conformal radiotherapy. But what changed the game is really SBRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy. Because stereotactic radiotherapy, we only treat the prostate with maybe one or two, M, uh, with two mm of margin, very, very, very tight margin. With SBRT, I still give about three or four or maybe five uh, mm margin. But with S SBRT, my margin is very, very low. So we treat so when, you, when we can cut down, oops, when we can cut down our margin, we are treating only to the tumor and nothing else. So we can limit morbidity and we can also start to, what we call dose escalate, increase the dose so that we can have a more effective uh, radiation treatment without causing the complication. So this is the SBRT uh, technology, uh, I, uh, sorry, IMRT technology that we use. You can see the the 50% uh, spill um, is still around the, the bladder and some of the, uh, the rectum uh, tissue here. Um, but, you know, it's, it is a 50% dose, so, so, so the side effects is not, uh, is not much. Uh, when you use SBRT, we need actually to put gold seeds or fiducials. Uh, we only treat with five fractions. We need this gold seed. And I normally ask the urologist, my urology colleague, to insert this gold seat for me. So that why the gold seat is my GPS. So when the prostate moves, I know where the position of the prostate. So it is always tracking the gold seat, which is tracking the movement of the prostate. And we give a high dose per fraction. So my five dose, my five dose of radiation is actually equivalent to almost 40 to 45 uh, 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 doses of conventional radiation and mounting to about 90 gray. And this is more than adequate to, to eradicate prostate cancer. You need about minimum of 70 gray. If you don't get 70 gray, if anybody who treats uh, prostate cancer with less than 70 gray um, or biological equivalent of 70 gray, uh, you will not get good tumor control. So you need a biological equivalent. Although I give 35 gray in five fraction, the, you, when you do the bioequivalent calculation, it's actually equivalent to about 90 gray. So this is my, my prostate here that you, know, we see, you can see now the, the tightness of the beam. I'll, I will show you a bit. So I can treat small, small prostate gland. I can treat a very small prostate gland or I can treat a very large prostate glands, uh, including the seminal vesicle, yeah, uh, with using this SBRT technology. So with uh, this, my current true beam, yeah, uh, this is the dose that I gave, 35 gray in five fraction. 35 gray in five fraction or seven gray per fraction is actually equivalent to about 90 gray using conventional uh, two gray per fraction treatment. So it is very, very, very high dose. And you can see this, this, this sparkling things here. These, these are the actual the fiducials or the gold seeds that we insert. So we monitor this. We monitor this uh, throughout treatment. And if the monitoring, if, if during treatment, the, the prostate moves uh, more than one or two mm, 
the machine gets cut off, the machine will stop. And then we have to readjust and realign the patient to the treatment position. Now, if you look at SBRT, what it, it can achieve, yeah, you see here, this is the rectum. And, and okay, this is the tumor. The tumor is getting 100% or more. It doesn't matter if it gets more than 100%. But what matters is you're, you're not worried about, you know, you need to give a very high dose, 100% or more to the prostate, which is here in this orangey red color. But more important is the bladder dose and the rectum dose. You can see the sharp fall off of the bladder and the rectum dose. Uh, to, and only about, you know, uh, small percentage of, 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 of bladder receives about 20 gray. And even 20 gray in five fraction is not enough to cause complications. So you can go a lot higher than, than that. But when we go to a lot higher dose, uh, touching about 30 gray, it's only about less than 5% of the bladder. So, so we can really spare the bladder and the rectum uh, from radiation damage and radiation complications, yeah. And treatment is not good enough. We need to see that we are treating it accurately all the time. So we use a technology called IGRT or image guidance radiotherapy so that the beams, the, the prostate is continually being monitored and to maintain less than one mm. And any deviation, one more than one mm or two mm, the beam cuts off. And then we, like I say, we have to realign the patient. So this technology is very, very important. Okay, just a little bit of experience. You know, we, we, we've analyzed about 50 patients uh, over the last uh, few years uh, on prostate treatment, and we can achieve a, a huge drop in, over time. Sometimes it may take about six to eight months to get a nadir count. Uh, of course, if we use hormonal as adjuvant, we get a faster nadir. But otherwise, it can take up to six months, eight months, 12 months for the PSA to drop. So it is slow to drop, but it will drop. Okay. And the beautiful thing is that our 95, our local control rate it touches almost a uh, 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 100% now. This was the old data, but the new one we analyzed, it's closer to 95%. Uh, one or two, uh, three patients actually uh, progressed, but they didn't progress in the prostate. So in, in, in terms of local control, it's all very good. Some of the patients who progressed were the high-risk patients who progressed uh, in, in the bones and in other tissues. Yeah. So like I say, the, the prostate comes down, very, the PSA comes down very, very slowly. Uh, with uh, SPRT. And the radiation side effects are really limited to grade 2 and grade 3, uh, but they only last for about 2 months and then the patients are, um, uh, are back to normal uh, and very few patients have erectile dysfunction unless we give hormonal treatment. Radiation cystitis and proctitis is something that we hardly see with SPRT these days. And this was some of the, the paper that was uh, described in ASCO, and you can see that the, this was a study in, in the US, the 12-year control rate you know, from, uh, for, for low, intermediate, and high-risk group ranges from about 90%, and even the high-risk group, we were getting 88% uh, control, uh, PSA control rate uh, at 12 years. At 12 years, 88%. So, and and it did not, if, you know, so, so the local control rate for SPRT was very, very high. And the next thing to note is the toxicity was very, very mild. Yeah, and, and, and excellent. And the study shows that there are excellent local control with SBRT. And the more important thing is that the local control remained durable for over, over 12 years or more. And since this paper, there are a lot more other uh, papers that were published. And there was some recent paper looking at uh, 6,000 patients in a meta-analysis, again, confirming a very high local control rate with radiotherapy uh, using uh, SBRT technology. So, but in Malaysia, there are not many patients who are offered SBRT and, and not many of my colleagues actually are familiar 
with using the five fraction as BRT. You really need to have a really good team of physics and quality control before you can do this. Otherwise, you will just cause more damage you know, because you're giving high dose per treatment. And if you don't know what you're doing, then, then the technique is not forgiving. So you really need to be well trained on this technique. Yeah. Now in Beacon, my, my protocol is that for early stage, we do for stage one, stage two, either I give SBRT alone or I give high SBRT with hormonal injection for intermediate and high risk. If they have pelvic nodes uh, involvement, then I don't do SBRT. I don't do SBRT. I, I use uh, another technique called um, IMRT or VMAT using my Halcyon machine. And normally I give about 38 treatments uh, followed by injection. Uh, or if patients who had surgery and the margins are positive with the rising PSA, uh, then we, I use uh, Halcyon. I don't use... Uh, I don't use uh, SBRT because I, there's no more prostate to monitor, uh, to, to, to uh, follow. Yeah. Now, um, I'm just going to move on from early stage to uh, metastatic. Uh, these are, as you know, uh, definition of metastatic when the cancer has spread uh, distant to the prostate and it can include nodes and, and also uh, to the other uh, organs. Uh, mainly common is in the bone. So when they have a prostate uh, spread, we need to give them, uh, we need to block the hormones. We know that prostate cancer is very hormone dependent. So ADT or androgen deprivation treatment is the first line that, uh, treatment that we use for advanced prostate cancer. And this can be done either med medically or surgically. Surgically means removing the, the, pros uh, the, the testes. And, and the androgen therapy uh, 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 blocks uh, the testosterone from reaching the growth receptor on the surface of the uh, prostate. And, 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 and you know, um, sometimes we need to prevent the flare as well. So ADT should be started as soon as possible when you're diagnosed with uh, uh, advanced or metastatic prostate cancer. We need to stop the disease from getting worse and decrease the risk of cancer-related complications. And, but then the quality of life issues because it can cause um, erectile dysfunction, uh, hot flushing and all that, that must be discussed with the patient. So there are many drugs that we can use uh, and the injection is every month or every three months or even every six months uh, injected. And, but unfortunately, sometimes things don't go well and they do develop resistance to hormone treatment over a period of time. So when you have castrate resistant uh, prostate cancer should, is the, when prostate cancer gets worse despite uh, we deprive them of testosterone and the PSA keeps going up and additional drugs may be required. So some of these drugs like you mentioned just now is abiatrone and zalutamide. Um, and these are some of, I'm not going to go through the details, so adding uh, 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 drugs like enzalutamide to to homo, uh, ADT uh, actually helps to improve the overall survival uh, in prostate cancer patients in many of the studies, the Archer, the Prevail, the POSPER, the Enzymet study. And if the problem is once you put them on hormonal second-line treatment, sometimes uh, disease continues to progress. And then what do you do? Um, uh, uh, we Sometimes we need to put uh, add chemotherapy. Um, uh, but nowadays we use chemotherapy upfront uh, for early stage of prostate cancer, especially for, for, for younger patients. And if chemotherapy, normally we use docetaxel, but there's also another drug called carbizitaxel, uh, which you can use to salvage uh, if docetaxel fails. Um, this is a nice study, which I think may be a game changer uh, it's the P study that was uh, recently um, published in, 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 in uh, ESMO uh, and in the journal. So one of the key issues uh, about this is actually uh, adding chemotherapy and drug uh, like abiaterone to the, to the standard of care, uh, plus or minus radiation treatment. And this study shows that there's almost like a doubling of the progression survival. The progression-free survival um, 
uh, for this group is, is, is touching almost five years uh, compared to the, just the standard of care group. So something that we hope to, uh, you know, to be um, doing in the, uh, 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 talking. To, and, and the advantage of this now is that we have generic, so it will bring down the cost of treatment. So we have generic, generic uh, uh, docetaxel and generic um, uh, abiaterone. And so hopefully we can have this kind of treatment more accessible to more patients. Yeah. Now, there's some new development in, 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 um, in the teams in, in, in management is, is the molecular profiling. Last time we used to do BRCA tests uh, for only breast cancer. But now we are also looking at testing BRCA which is an inheritance gene you know, for, uh, for, for prostate cancer. We know now that patients with HRR or homologous recombinant repair, um, uh, they have a poorer prognosis or BRCA positive patients, they have poorer prognosis and uh, survival is almost cut by half. Yeah? And, and, and up to about a third, 30% uh, of patients or uh, prostate patients may have uh, HRR driven uh, metastatic uh, prostate cancer. Yeah. So, so, like I say, two in 10 patients with prostate cancer have um, BRCA1 or ATM. So, nowadays, what we do is we have prostate cancer. We have to think about testing them for BRCA. So, we can send them. I, I think it costs around 2,000 over ringgit or three, two to 3,000 ringgit to do the BRCA or HRR testing. And when we do the, the testing, if they turn out to be positive, we can think about a, a, a drug called a PARP inhibitor, PARP inhibitor. And this was a study, uh, a profound study, uh, where patients with positive BRCA or ATM, they were either given uh, Limpasa or the new hormonal uh, treatment, you know, the abiaterone or other hormones. And, and the impressive thing about these patients who are HRR positive, given Limpasa, you can see that the progression-free survival is almost double, 7.4 months versus 3.6 months. And also the overall survival is uh, very much improved. So you know, like, um, so Wong was talking about, you know, now we are buying time, you know, so, we, you know, so we've got uh, good hormonal drugs that can extend uh, survival. Now we add chemotherapy that improves survival. And then if all else fails, you know, we still have, uh, we can still test them for BRCA. And, and if they are BRCA positive, we can think about Limpasa. But unfortunately, we don't have Limpasa in generic form. It has, it is still a patented drug and the cost is, is, is quite high. Um, uh, it is not uh, uh, government in the government listing. So maybe something that the Prostate Cancer Society can speak to the drug companies to have uh, better access because not only for prostate cancer, this drug is used for, lung, uh, for breast cancer and also for pancreatic cancer. So I'll, I'll end my talk by saying that prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers affecting elderly with, uh, men and with screening and early detection where and the cancer is localized, it's amenable to curative um, treatment. We have advances in, in radiation technique that can cut down the mo mo morbidity and, and, and mortality uh, of, of treatment. And s is also an effective, attractive new way of treating patients where we can complete the treatment within a week. Uh, so the treatment time is five days. Uh, including all the preparation, putting in the producials, uh, plus another sort of three or four days. So within two weeks, and you don't need to come into hospital. It's all outpatient treatment, uh, except when you put in the producial. And stage four disease, hormonal treatment, chemotherapy is now uh, you know, um, uh, part and parcel of, of the standard of care treatment. And BRCA mutation may increase treatment option for patients with advanced uh, prostate cancer uh, and the use of PARP inhibitors may have an important role. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks Tato. I think uh, Tato, uh, Dr. Brian has given us a very comprehensive uh, uh, 
update on the management of uh, prostate cancer, be it uh, early, at one stage, and so on and so forth. I'm sure we have uh, learned a lot in terms of looking at um, the amount of uh, uh, opportunities that we have in terms of uh, treatment, right? Um, next one, we will have our next speaker. A minute, huh? Right. Our next speaker will be um, Dr. Tay. Okay, hey, um, just to give an uh, introduction of Dr. Tay, I think he's the uh, first time uh, uh, presenting uh, to Prostate Cancer Society and we are very glad to get uh, Dr. Tay. Can you all hear me? Yeah, Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, great, great. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Tay uh, is from East Malaysia and we're so glad to get uh, Dr. Tay to uh, come on board to share his experience uh, with our members. Um, Dr. Tay, basically, he was uh, graduated in, uh, in uh, UM, uh, UC Malaya. And after that, he did his FRS, uh, CS in Edinburgh. And of course, um, he's currently the uh, head of uh, urology department, uh, UC Sarawak. And he's also the adjunct lecturer, faculty of science for the UC of uh, Sarawak. Right? And Dr. Tay has a, a wide range of uh, membership. And he's a member of the Association of Urology, American Urology Associations, Society of Robotic Surgery. Uh, this one is in Societe International. This must be uh, French. <laughs> American College of Surgeon and uh, also Urology of Associates of uh, Southeast uh, uh, Asia. And of course, um, he's also have um, very good credentials nationally as well as internationally. Uh, he has a co- Chair in uh, various uh, uh, what it, uh, meetings uh, like UAA in 2019. Um, he was also the president of the Urology Associations and also uh, Urology Association uh, Council members of Asia. Um, he, he was the organizing chairman for the 19th Asian Urology uh, Conference and also uh, he sits in the board of the Urology, right? Um, also at the National Specialist uh, Registrar for Urology, uh, which is the committee. And also he is the editorial board member of the Asia Journal of Urology. Um, of course, um, Dr. Tay also has got a very excellent service awards. Uh, he got it, uh, the, he won the excellent service award from the Department of uh, Health, Sarawak. Congratulations. And in terms of academic research, as you can see, has um, written uh, and co-written co a lot of papers. Uh, he has uh, been uh, invited lecturer for uh, 51 uh, uh, sessions and also uh, he has uh, 65 publications uh, on neurological abstracts. Um, currently, he's also the principal investigator for several trials, Manitou, Atlas, Prospel, and Strike. Um, okay, these are very important trials for uh, uh, the patients like us, is it? Okay, without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Tay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kong. Let me share my screen. Uh, Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you again for the uh, Prostate Cancer Society in Malaysia, uh, Mr. President, Dr. Uh, Mr. Wong, Kong Seng, Secretary Stephen Kong, uh, for inviting me to share the platform with uh, uh, eminent speaker like uh, Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Ng to share our uh, experience and treatment for prostate cancer so that maybe at the end of the day, we can learn uh, uh, update ourselves on uh, some of the uh, information and knowledge um, that may uh, help us to uh, uh, improve the quality of life and survival of prostate cancer in Malaysia. So I've been given the task to speak on the evaluation and treatment for patients with early prostate cancer. Uh, you can hear my voice quite uh, clearly or not? Let me check first, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yes, very, very clear, clear, very clear, very clear. Okay, very that's, clear. that's great. 
Uh, so, as you know, I work in uh, Sarawak General Hospital. I've been working here uh, since 1992. So, it's been a long time. And uh, I think uh, I see a wide spectrum of prostate cancer disease in the public hospital. Um, so, with that, I think uh, I can uh, share some of my experience with you on, in these particular topics and how do we evaluate and treat uh, early prostate cancer in Malaysia. Now, as Dr. Ibrahim has uh, highlighted to you, a prostate gland, although most of us know the anatomy just below the bladder and then uh, in front of the rectum, and it's only, uh, only man has prostate, technically speaking. And the function of this gland is really is a sexual. There are two major functions. One is a urinary function, one is a sexual function. By itself, it's a sexual organ. It's a producer, semen, and then nourish the sperm. And it is a muscular switch between urination and ejaculation. And this is very important because any treatment on the glands can affect your urination as well as ejaculation and also erectile function because the glands is enveloped within the network of a, a nerve that has a sub uh, lead to erection in a normal male. So one of the very common questions we ask is that why men develop prostate cancer? Now, and somebody develop cancer, then they want to know why, why they get that or their close family member, they have that. Do we have the answer for that? So I think many of the factors are actually non-modifiable. The well-known factor like age, for example, people tend to get prostate cancer as they grow above the age of 50. Below 50 is quite rare. And race, you can't change your race. And fortunately, actually for Asian, Asian, generally speaking, have a lower incidence of prostate cancer per population as compared to Caucasian or African. And uh, family history, of course, if there's a family member who has breast or prostate cancer, in particular, if they happen at a younger age, and then the chances of uh, getting prostate cancer increase, in particular, if they have a mutation in the BRCA gene too. So geography, in an interesting study on Japanese uh, staying in Hawaii and compared to Japanese in the Japan, they found that Japanese in, Hawaiian, in, Jap in Hawaii have a higher incidence of prostate cancer as compared to Japanese living in Japan Island itself. Mainly this could be, the, spec the speculation is that maybe that's related to lifestyle issue as a westernized diet may increase the risk of one's developed prostate cancer, although it's not as high as the Caucasian. Now, age is the most important factor. And uh, I think this is, need to, we need to recognize it, not that we can change it. Because below age of 50, the chances of one developed prostate cancer, even in the America, is quite low, 0.2%. Whereas if one reaches the age of 70, the chances of it being diagnosed with prostate cancer is 8.2%. But as you can see, the increase is quite, it's not linear, it's actually exponential after the age of 50. And the chances of one die of prostate cancer is not as high as one will get a prostate cancer. So what does it mean? It means not all cancer will kill the patient. And some of the cancer may be indolent, so to speak, to be very brandy. Patient may be dying with the cancer rather than because of the cancer. So these are the cancer that we tend we try not to diagnose and not to treat if we diagnose one. Now, we back to this BRCA gene mutation. We have heard it from uh, Dr. Ibrahim earlier on, and I will not deal with it. And uh, suffice to say is that people who have BRCA gene mutation will tend to get more aggressive cancer, more advanced cancer, and also more resistant to conventional treatment in terms of chemotherapy, as well as abilatron or enzalutamide. And these are the group of patients who particularly may benefit from uh, oraparib or PUP inhibitor. Now, at this moment, those medicine is only for third-line treatment, meaning that you have failed uh, all these uh, conventional hormone treatment before you can move on to oraparib. But there are many studies ongoing now to move this uh, treatment to the earlier phase and uh, who patient, who, who have, for patients who have this uh, mutation. Other possible causes which uh, you may read it in the internet, like diet, overweight patient, exposure to nickel, nickel or circadian, 
and certain bacteria infection or even prostate inflammation, these are associated risks. And they are basically uh, identified from epidemiological study and it's not true experiment. So the association remained not very strong, but certainly it helped to have a healthy diet and a fit physique as well as a, a, a normal BMI to start off with for general health purposes. Now, how common is prostate cancer? You had listened to Dato Ibrahim lecture earlier on on all those statistics, but what I want to bring you to more attention is our local data and real life data. Now, prostate cancer in fact is very common and on the international autopsy study, meaning that they do an old autopsy series and then look at how frequent this cancer happen in people die of any other reason. For example, accident, stroke, MI, and they never have a prostate cancer diagnosed in their lifetime. They found that prostate cancer is far more common. And when someone reach 90, more than 50% will have cancer uh, in their prostate, even though they die of something else. So that, what is the, less, what is the message? The message means, quite a significant number of cancer remain indolent, unharmful to the patient, yeah, even if they're diagnosed. So on the global, prostate cancer now is the uh, rank number three in terms of uh, men cancer, the most common cancer in men diagnosed in Malaysia based on projection of incidence in 2020 by uh, global can. And 4.4% of all cancer death, it account for 4.4%. Yeah. Now, on one of the Malaysian study of cancer survivor, MyScan, sponsored by National Cancer Registry and NCI, published in 2017, it showed that the top 10, the most common cancer, you can see there are two graphs here. Now, the five-year survival rate for all the cancer, if you chart them according to stage, prostate cancer has the best survival if it's stage one, 97.3% have a relative survivor. Relative survivor means if you have 100 patients who has prostate cancer stage one, compared to another 100 patients who doesn't have prostate cancer, but they have similar health status, 97.3 of those with prostate cancer stage one will still be around at five years as compared to the other 100 patients. So in that sense, prostate cancer diagnosis of stage one is not end of the world. It's highly treatable and curable disease, irrespective how you choose to treat them and if you treat them by a specialist. How about stage four? Stage four is a lethal disease, no doubt, for many cancer. And if you look at pancreatic cancer, if you have stage four cancer, only 5.7% will live to five years as compared to somebody who do not have it. But Prostate cancer, 43.2% is almost as good as a childhood lymphoma. So this data is very important for us to keep in mind. So when you have someone is diagnosed stage four, it's not end of the world. Yeah, there's still more than 50% chance one will live more than five years with a proper treatment. Uh, in the just published uh, data in September in the cancer medicine, uh, we have a Malaysian data, multi-center study over a three years period on the prostate. Uh, we collect the data of all the prostate cancer patients diagnosed in the nine hospitals in the public hospital, Kuala Lumpur, Selayang, and uh, Sarawak General Hospital, of course, is one of it. So out of the 1,830 over, pa uh, over patients diagnosed to have prostate cancer at various stages, we found that the average age of diagnosis is about 70, from 65 to 75. So you can see there are not many patients diagnosed younger than 65 in this particular group of patients. In terms of family history of prostate cancer, it's quite a uh, surprise to see actually the incidence is very high, 4.1%. Yeah, somebody will have family history of prostate cancer, not history of cancer, but prostate cancer, one in 25. In terms of uh, PSA and diagnosis, it's quite sad. More than... Uh, 51% of the patients have PSA more than 50, meaning that they will be having a metastatic disease, most likely when they have a prostate cancer. And if the cancer among these patients mostly are highly significant cancer and quite a big number of them, 54.8% are Gleason 8 and above. And to this group of uh, audience, I think you understand when you have a higher Gleason score, the cancer is uh, more aggressive 
as compared to someone who have a lower Gleason score. So in terms of the survival of the, uh, this group of patients, and you look at these uh, four lines, stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four, clearly demonstrate patient with stage four disease, the 50, uh, the mean overall survival rate is far inferior as compared to someone who has stage one, stage two, and stage three. So in summary, you can see from these studies that we're still seeing very advanced disease, even in this modern era. So how do, these are mainly due to social economic and also health-seeking behavior as well as cultural background of our population. So there's a lot for us to do to how to bring down the stage. So even you have the most fantastic machine or robots or radiotherapy machine in your hospital, if you are treating stage four or stage three patient, the outcome is not going to be as good as stage one or two. Uh, we will not move to that, but as you know, localized prostate cancer, stage one and stage two is considered as an early prostate cancer. Well, if someone who have a cancer spread outside the prostate gland itself, either breach through the capsule, in this case, or going to the seminal vesicle or going to the bladder neck, then they are considered as stage four. Of course, stage four also include patients who have metastasis or lymph node disease. Uh, but here I'm just speaking about localized pro uh, the local prostate cancer. Even non-metastatic can still be stage four if they have an extensive uh, localized disease, local disease. So how do we diagnose prostate cancer? As you, ha you have already seen all those statistics. In Malaysia and in public hospital in particular, we still see many uh, metastatic and uh, prostate cancer presentation. So they present with weight loss, back ache, fracture, renal failure, and even paralysis. So a patient, if you present in this kind of state, is uh, depressing and it's also very sad. And their survival is not going to be as good as certainly far, far uh, inferior as somebody who have early localized prostate cancer. Now, if someone who have early localized prostate cancer, typically they have no symptom at all. They're most commonly, they are picking up, pick up by a high PSA and they undergo a prostate biopsy and then that's how they get to diagnose with prostate cancer. Or could be an incidental assessment, finding from assessment for uh, BPH where the PSA is high and then they have a biopsy. For localized advanced disease, then they may have a blood in the urine and they may not be able to pee. Uh, so these are also considered as an advanced symptom. Now you, now you understand prostate cancer is not as, all the same, just like cats. Not all cats are the same. So you can have a pussycat and you can have a tiger. Now, for a doctor, he need to identify the patient in front of him is having a pussycat prostate cancer or having a tiger prostate cancer. There are certain features to help us to differentiate between these two. I think this is very important. If someone have a metastatic disease, of course, this is a tiger. That is for sure. For localized disease, then, you can, we can look at the various uh, factors, like for example, their PSA presentation and their stage of disease and whether the Gleason grades is high or low. Typically, pussycat, they are slow growing and they are found in those autopsy series. Well, later cancer, they are reported in the cancer statistics, meaning that patient is likely to succumb to the disease if they live long enough. So then come to the key question. Do you need to actually screen for prostate cancer? Population screening means that ask everybody on the street to do PSA is a no. Yeah, even in the Western country, it may be controversial, where the incidence is much higher than Asian country. Before we can move to that screening question, then we need to understand this prostate-specific antigen, the age, the so-called tumor marker. In fact, it's not a it's considered part of it as a tumor marker, but it's prostate specific, not cancer specific. So when someone have a prostate cancer or possibly have a prostate, uh, uh, whether early or late prostate cancer, their PSA will go up or more, most of the time, most of the time. And for normal people with a prostate in side two, they also have PSA. And the PSA can go up because of uh, enlarged prostate infection or any of the procedure done on the bladder or the prostate. So as someone grow older, partly mainly because the prostate grow bigger, then they also have a higher reference range 
to decide whether one have a normal PSA or an abnormal PSA to dictate whether a biopsy is warranted or not. Now, for, in a, for perspective, I think we need to know, even below four, somebody can still have prostate cancer. This is a nice study done many years ago where you look at biopsy of all the patients in a, in a prostate cancer prevention trial, where even they have a normal PSA, they still undergo protocol-based biopsy. Even a PSA of one, you still have a 1% chance to have significant prostate cancer. So this is in the American white population. So that is why a finger prostate check, finger examination is still very important to detect uh, early prostate cancer in Malaysia setting. So what are the advantages if one do a PSA test? This is so-called patient counseling. If you do a PSA testing and you have an early prostate cancer detection, if the test is normal, then you feel reassured. And you may be able to, if it's abnormal, you do a biopsy, then you detect an early prostate cancer. But on the other hand, there are downsides of doing a PSA screening, meaning that you have no symptoms, just go to have a PSA check. So first thing is that it's not 100% accurate. If your PSA is raised, you may need more tests, meaning that you will subject yourself to a more PSA test, MRI, prostate biopsy. And end of the day, the cancer that's diagnosed may be a pussycat, but you still will live with anxiety with the pussycat prostate cancer inside your body. So we should check PSA. Currently, the recommendation is that his man is about 50 and above and he's well informed, meaning that he understands the implication of a positive and negative PSA test. Then you should go ahead and have a test if you want to know to have early prostate cancer. And this is certainly true for people who have family history of prostate cancer or breast cancer or someone who have an abnormal finger examination and the doctor decided to do. Certainly, if somebody is 75 and above and has no symptom, he should then have a prostate uh, PSA uh, check to detect early prostate cancer unless he has symptom. Okay. Um, so this is what we want. We are, we are not going to go to this. Um, so goal of early detection is that to early to detect early prostate cancer, uh, uh, the pussy cat, the, the tiger prostate cancer early, so that we can treat them. Uh, before they spread outside of the glands. So, I, I believe uh, in the prostate cancer support group for those who unfortunately have prostate cancer diagnosed, you are very worried Yeah, when you have first received your PSA result, maybe something like this. It's really very worried. So you many things go through your thought. You will, you prob most probably you will consult uh, Mr. Google or internet or literature or friends or doctors to find out whether this could be cancer or not. So then you will go through your mind, it's a biopsy and MRI. But I already mentioned early on, for PSA of that level, you still can have many other causes, non-cancer causes uh, to account for those raised PSA. So naturally you will consult a doctor, preferably a urologist, to investigate this high PSA. You will talk to you, go through what I have uh, presented earlier on and the finger check, prostate check will be done. So most of the time, most of the time, they will not proceed straight away to do MRI or prostate biopsy. They will ask for a repeat of PSA to see whether this is a truly elevated uh, PSA and to check your urine whether there's a concurrent infection. If this is none, then patient may undergo a prostate biopsy to see whether there's any cancer in the glands or not. Of course, nowadays we do an MRI before a prostate biopsy. Now, how is the biopsy performed? The biopsy can be done in two routes. One is through the perineum, through the skin between the rectum and uh, your scrotum. So this is uh, inserting, uh, but the probe is still in the rectum. The other one is through the needle is go through the rectum and then go into the prostate. This is so-called the conventional biopsy of course, you can see if you have a biopsy through the rectum, the trajectory of the needle is different as compared to the transperineal biopsy. So if a cancer is the front of the prostate, then it's more likely to be diagnosed by the transperineal route as compared to a needle coming up through the rectum. So which is better? I think your urologist or the doctor is best to discuss with individual patient because this can be determined by the MRI scan. 
So you heard a lot about prostate MRI. So prostate MRI is done usually with a contrast injection. And after they've done a series of scan on the prostate, then they come up with a grading system of any suspicious lesion that the radiology identify on the MRI scan, either as the PRAT3, PRAT4, or PRAT5 lesion. Those in the red box, meaning that these are the lesions which are suspicious of clinically important or significant prostate cancer. One and two doesn't mean there's no cancer. It just means that uh, having a high-grade cancer is less likely or unlikely. So this is the meaning of all these uh, period scan. So now once, if somebody have done an MRI and a high PSA want to undergo a prostate biopsy, there are two ways of doing it. You have an MRI lesion. So the modern way of doing it is called a fusion biopsy where you have the image of the MRI, you merge with the uh, prostate ultrasound image in real time uh, when you are doing the biopsy, because during biopsy, you are doing the ultrasound to guide the needle. But the MRI image is done before that. So you, in, you fuse the MRI image into the ultrasound machine where you can identify the MRI machine on the transrectal ultrasound machine. Then you can target or direct the needle onto the lesion. How you direct the needle, there are many software and things that can be done. This is only one machine. Another one, some of you may have heard of it, it's called BioBot, where you can use a robotic arm to position the needle exactly to where you want it to biopsy. So both of these uh, methods are available in Malaysia in public as well as in private hospital. So if you're using this kind of technique of targeted biopsy, then you can see if you have a uh, PRAP5 lesion, the chances of detecting significant cancer, important cancer, the tiger, is 83%. And you may pick up 11% of a pussycat out of all the cancer. So in general, the cancer diagnostic rate is very high. Those who have PRAP5 lesion, the compare of PRAP3 lesion. One and two is not biopsy, so we do not know. So I think uh, the the precision or the accuracy of MRI uh, lesion identified on MRI and we you compare it to a prostatectomy specimen is that it's very, it's very accurate, it's very accurate. In fact, those lesions who are period three and four will have a, uh, 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 will have a reported as a, a period four and five and it's a Gleason three and four lesion and above. So this is the basis of how the subsequent study come about to decide why we need an MRI. So in a nutshell, I can uh, share with you is that using an MRI as a screening tool as compared to using a trust biopsy as a screening tool for a patient who have an elevated PSA up to 15, four to 15 is that if you have a negative MRI, you have PSA of about seven or eight. Negative MRI, no PLAT5 lesion, so the chance, you are pretty sure 90% the men have no cancer or no clinically important cancer. If you subject the man to a biopsy, if the biopsy come back negative, he still can miss 26% of a clinically important cancer. So in nutshell, this is the main message from the using an MRI. So we wouldn't go through this. Uh, so the recommendation is to perform MRI before prostate biopsy and also perform MRI before repeat prostate biopsy. If you have a biopsy which is negative to start off with without MRI being done, now you should do an MRI if the PSA continue to go up and you need to have a repeat biopsy. So once you have a biopsy, then this is how a biopsy looks like. It's a very tiny uh, tissue, about two centimeter times one millimeter length. And then you put under microscope and then you can grade the cancer according to the Gleason score, grade one, two, three, four, five. And then you come out to a different uh, uh, cancer group, also one, two, three, four, five. The higher the group, the, high, the more aggressive the cancer, of course. Just like any cancer, once somebody is diagnosed to have a prostate cancer from the biopsy, you need to stage the cancer to see whether it's uh, confined to the prostate or it has spread outside the prostate with uh, various kinds of scan. So usually the 
Conventional scan is called CT scan and bone scan to detect metastasis. But with the current age PSMA PET uh, gallium scan is uh, replacing uh, bone scan and CT scan in many advanced countries, in particularly in Australia and also in uh, Euro certain European country. And I believe in, it's already approved with FDA then in American as well. If you have a PSMA PET, then you probably do not need to have a CT or bone scan or subsequent assessment in terms of a metastasis. So how do we treat patients with early prostate cancer? Now, it all boils down to the patient and the cancer itself. If the patient is very fit and the patient have a good sexual function, whether the patient have any uh, urinary symptom and also the side effect of various treatment options like surgery and radiation, how is the patient acceptance to all those things and have to take into consideration beside the cancer, the behavior of the cancer itself. So what can be done if one is diagnosed as an early prostate cancer, no lymph nodes, no metastasis, only confined to the prostate. Now, most of the time, the patient is the most important. Now, as a, pa if a very young patient, most of it will choose a prostatectomy. You can look at it 52%, another 24% radiation, and then some choose a hormone treatment or no treatment for those younger patients below 65. This is the American data. But for those above 65, many choose, in fact, many choose a hormone treatment alone and only one third will choose radiation and very small number choose surgery. That is understandable. So this you have gone through based on the risk stratification of the early prostate cancer, then you can decide what you want to do. This is very important. This is very important because low risk disease, you can treat with uh, actually uh, active observation and monitoring and deferred treatment option. Whereas those with intermediate and high risk, usually you will need to have choose between radiation or surgery. So when we, who are the people suitable for active surveillance? Some of you may have heard about it, meaning that you have, someone is diagnosed to have prostate cancer, but no active treatment, no surgery, no radiation, just watch and monitor. But doesn't mean do, we do not do anything. Active surveillance, the principle is based on what I have presented earlier on, the natural history of the prostate cancer, the low aggressiveness of Gleason 6 prostate cancer, and also the uh, uh, data in the many of the clinical publications as to support the safety of this particular mode of treatment. Of course, the main pitfall is misclassification, meaning that the person actually have a high-risk disease, but for some reason, the high-grade cancer was not diagnosed on the prostate biopsy. So what do we do as a doctor, urologist, where somebody uh, we actively survey someone with early prostate cancer? We do not do the surgery. We check the PSA every six months. And then also we do a finger examination every one year. And for repeat biopsy and MRI, if PSA is rising, this is most of the time the practical approach for people who undergo active surveillance. But there's a trigger. If any of this trigger happen, then the patient will move on to either radiation treatment or prostatectomy, meaning that they have a higher grade of cancer, they have a, on MRI or on biopsy, or the PSA is going up beyond 10, or the patient find it very anxious or very difficult to continue to live with prostate cancer in their body. So the safety of active surveillance is excellent, actually. If you look at many of these studies, it shows that 10 years uh, cancer-specific survival, meaning that 99% of the patient will not die of prostate cancer in 10 years follow-up if they have a low-risk prostate cancer and they do this kind of follow-up strategy. And of course, the patient will still die of something else in 10 years because these are a group of elderly patients, but these are due to non-prostate cancer death as compared to prostate cancer death in this uh, the longest follow-up study on active surveillance in Canada. So there is a very strong evidence from a randomized control trial, huh? level one evidence in UK called PROTECT trial, where they randomized 1,600 people with prostate cancer, early prostate cancer, low risk to either active surveillance, radiation, or prostatectomy. Equal number, you can see. 
The nutshell is that the prostate cancer death, non-prostate cancer death is the same. Prostate cancer death at 10 years, also about the same, not nearly statistically significant. Only difference is that some of the patients will progress in the active surveillance group, double as compared, as well as metastasis, double as though we're active treatment. So this, again, proved that active surveillance in a well-selected group of patients is safe. Then we move, now I move to uh, surgery. Yeah, since I'm a surgeon, so of course, surgery is a good treatment for prostate cancer, in particular in well-selected patient and well-informed patient. In surgery, you completely remove the prostate, the seminal vesicle, and then you join it back with a suture. So in a nutshell, this is a very simple conceptually, but technically it's a highly challenging procedure and operation to be done because you need to preserve the sexual and urinary function for the patient and order to come on top of complete removal of the cancer. So sometimes we need to remove the lymph node as well, especially in high risk patients. Now, the prostatectomy, there are many advantages, but there are also shortcomings, just like radiation treatment. The advantage is, like I said earlier on, the cancer can be proven to be completely removed. If it's completely removed and there's no PSA detectable after prostatectomy, no further treatment is required. The patient can move to just PSA surveillance and follow up. And the risk of complication is quite low. Dying from the surgery is far less than 1%. In fact, many quoted 0.1% now with the robots. And there are certain complications like transfusion, wound infection, urinary leakage during, uh, from the drain, which is uh, usually very low. And transfusion rate is the, around 0.6% for the robot, while 10.10% for open surgery. The disadvantage you heard earlier on, because of the nerve is enveloping the prostate, so when you remove the prostate, some of this nerve will be removed. If you preserve the nerve in a high-risk patient, you also may preserve some prostate cancer cell. That itself will lead to local recurrence and even relapse of the disease. So it's not advisable to preserve the nerve for high-risk patient. Long-term urinary incontinence after one year, meaning that patient still incontinence, it happened in one in 20 patients. Patient may need one or two pets. Incontinence means using of any pets. Um, we wouldn't go into treats. Now, for discussion of prostatectomy, uh, we cannot escape from mentioning the robots. There are three ways to, re to remove the prostate safely. One is open surgery. Another is laparoscopy. Another one is the robot-assisted laparoscopy surgery. This, both of these are keyhole surgery, except robot will use an articulated a robotic platform to hold the instrument and to control the instrument because the, the instrument are controlled by the surgeon through a console where the surgeon is uh, looking at uh, like playing uh, virtual reality video games where they can look at the glands in a 3D manner. But what is important is to the patient. To the surgeon, this is the most comfortable operation uh, position to operate a prostate technique. This is the least comfortable and this is stressful because of bleeding. But to the patient, what's important is the outcome. Cancer control, urinary function, and sexual function. I can report to you that based on literature review, there's no difference in terms of sexual, urinary function, outcome, as well as cancer outcome. Whether you do in this way, or this way, or this way. Why? Because level one evidence, and many of the series does show that in terms of cancer relapse, whether you do it whichever way is the same. But the advantage of robot is that the surgeon can see better if you have an early and low risk cancer, the chances of preserving the nerve is far better as you compare to do laparoscopy or uh, open surgery. And robot has its advantage in less bleeding, shorter hospital stay, less bladder neck contracture. Bladder neck contracture is an important thing to pay attention to, meaning that the patient will need more operation and sometimes even need catheterization to overcome the outcome of a bladder neck contracture. So this complication, although it's not fatal, but it affects the quality of life of the patient, of course. Now I can show you the video now. These are two operations done by very, very experienced 
uh, world-class master of uh, prostatectomy. On this right hand is done by the pioneer of uh, open robotic operation. On this hand, uh, open surgery, open surgeon. This is a, a very experienced robotic surgeon. Now, I know uh, if you are not a doctor, but if you're looking at this, even you are a lay person, you look at this, you can appreciate. On the robot, the view is very stable. The instrument is very stable and the bleeding is minimum as compared to an open surgery where your hand may even obscure your view. And they are doing the same part of the operation where the vein is uh, the most, uh, uh, bleed, uh, the part that is have the most chance of bleeding in fact. And in terms of joining back, you can see the robot is very elegant in joining back after the prostate is removed, you need to join back the urinary tract, the bladder and the urethra. That was the laparoscopic, also a very experienced laparoscopic French surgeon. You can see it has tremor, it has tremor, yeah. So it's less precise as compared to the robot. And certainly the surgeon will be more comfortable operating on this rather than this. Now, how, why, why is it the robot able to do so? Because the robot have a 3D vision. The robot use a articulated instrument. The instrument only articulated at the end of the tip of the instrument where you have scissor, you have grasper, you have everything. That is the, like open surgery, but very miniaturized. It's like a 10 cent coin. No? So robot, of course, undergo uh, evolution. Malaysia acquired this robot back in 2004, in, uh, one in Kuching, one in uh, Kuala Lumpur, in a government hospital, in fact. So this is the first generation of robot back in 1999 when they first used. Undergo now is on the fifth generation. Now, 2017, they have Da Vinci XI. Open surgery hasn't evolved that much. So in terms of technological advancement, robot, has, in fact, has advanced and the view has improved and the type of instrument able to use the robot has also increased. So I mentioned to you earlier on the study, so you can see cancer control, no different between laparoscopy, open or robot, but safety of surgery, certainly robot is a safer procedure as compared to open or laparoscopy. But I think bottom line is the surgeon who do the operation is most important. In fact, in my view, because the surgeon is the one who drive the robot, handle the laparoscopic instrument, or using the scissor to do the open surgery. So you should find a competent surgeon if you choose to have a surgery to remove the prostate, right? rather than choosing uh, the, 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 the equipment that he has. So of course, you want to choose a robot, then you have to look at the very experienced robotic surgeon who have a good result, who have published result, to share his own personal theory to see what is the outcome like? Now, although there's no difference, but many of you know, many of the famous people in this region, including the uh, two premier of Singapore, our neighboring country, has voted robotic with their own prostate. Yeah, so that really instilled the confidence on robots. So the randomized control trial is not going to change the picture of a prostatectomy. In fact, today, 95% of prostate cancer prostate is removed through the robot, by the robots in US alone. In Malaysia, I believe the number is probably about half-half. In Malaysia, robotic surgery is available in the six hospital. You can see here, two in the public, uh, there are four in the public hospital, two in the private hospital. Uh, in the place, in the hospital where I work now, in Sarawak General Hospital, we started robotic surgery back in 2008, in the May. So this is our first case of uh, uh, robotic prostatectomy using the standard robot at that time. So since then, we have done uh, more than 150 cases of uh, prostatectomy in, by using these robots. And of course, we use various other operations using the robots. So this is a team on that day when we've done our first case. Unfortunately or fortunately, uh, this robot is retiring. So this is the last day of the robot on the September 2021. So we have uh, we expect to get a new robot, Da Vinci XI, in, 2000, in uh, 2022, next year. So Da Vinci XI is uh, interesting because it's a single stand. It has four arms. And then you can see this arm is much more versatile as compared to Da Vinci SI which is currently available in other hospitals because the camera head can be rotated in any of this arm. And then you have far more joints. You can see the joint, all these are movable joints. 
including the articulated endoris at the tip. So in other words, it allows the surgeon versatility to move and to dissect in different angle and in difficulty, difficult uh, achieve uh, position. So radiotherapy, you heard the presentation. We wouldn't go to that. So what about monitoring? If somebody have a prostate removed or radiation of the prostate done, then naturally you need to follow up the patient. So PSA is there. You need to check the PSA every three or six months. And then no matter whether you have radiation or you have prostatectomy, you need to follow up with urinary and sexual function because radiation can also affect the uh, uh, lower urinary tract and it can cause frequency, urgency, and blood in the urine. And some of this radiation effect, sometimes it can appear many years later. But similarly, prostatectomy, patient can experience sometimes temporary incontinence and then you will improve. You need to advise and reinforce the need of pelvic floor exercise and then make sure you are doing it. And then the, also assess the improvement or worsening of the symptom by checking the number of pet use. Of course, erectile dysfunction can be treated with a PDE5 inhibitor or vacuum pump or injection therapy. Certainly some imaging may be helpful. This, is only this will only be used if the PSA start to go up, we call biochemical relapse. So when you have a relapse, it's very depressive, depressing to the patient. It signifies recurrent disease, but it doesn't equate to uh, um, uh, imminent death or imminent metastasis, in fact, because it depends when does it happen. If it happened many years after the prostatectomy, then as compared to somebody happened earlier, uh, it's not so significant. Also, how quickly the PSA climb up. If the PSA remain detectable, even after the prostatectomy, we call PSA persistent, then that is not a very good sign. That means there are prostate cell or prostate cancer cell remain in the patient body. So generally speaking, we need to review the specimen pathology to find out whether the cancer was very aggressive, whether the margin is negative, if the margin is positive or there are seminal vesicle involvement, high stage cancer, then radiation treatment may salvage uh, the biochemical relapse in some patients. But this is a complex issue. I think need to be discussed with the treating urologist or the oncologist for subsequent treatment. Usually if you have a BCR after a radiation treatment, most of the surgeon would not want to take out the prostate, even though the cancer is still confined within the prostate. Why? Because the side effect from the treatment is very high in terms of urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction is very high, far higher than someone who has no radiation before. So most of these patients, they actually move on to receive hormone treatment. I think in terms of BCR, the use of PSMA pad is increasingly getting popular and appropriate in some certain uh, uh, circumstances. I think need to be discussed before we uh, subject ourselves to do a PSM, subject the patient to PSMA pads. So if you, if uh, after radical prostatectomy, if the PSA go up in this kind of range, even less than 0.2, and as long as the ultra sensitive PSA detected the PSA, there's a one third chance you may find a PSMA pad positive lesion in somewhere, either in the pelvis or outside the pelvis. And this incident go high up beyond the, you can see if you have a BCR as defined by 0 0.2 or 0 0.4 even, half of the patient may have a metastasis already. So by doing a PSMA pad, we can uh, save, we can uh, avoid radiating some of the patient who actually already have metastasis. So BCR also have a different kind and I wouldn't want to uh, go into that. So, <clears throat> I think the treatment uh, in summary, uh, although this slide may seem uh, repetitive, but I think it's very important. And again, we stress the important or stratify the risk of the patient and select the appropriate treatment for the patient. For a select group of patients who are elderly, for example, 75 and above, who may have other medical condition, which may not, and who doesn't want to have radiation, and he also doesn't want to have a surgery, but you have a 
high risk prostate cancer, which is not metastasized. So it's not unreasonable to give them ADT monotherapy in this group of patients. Yeah. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, large number of prostate cancer in Malaysia and in particular also in Sarawak and Sabah are detected at advanced stage. So detecting aggressive prostate cancer early can certainly save life. So early cancer is curable, highly curable in fact. And the survival of metastatic cancer you see from the earlier presentation by Dr. Ibrahim is uh, significantly prolonged with those modern oral agents. So one important thing is uh, we do not need to treat every single prostate cancer that is diagnosed by a prostate biopsy. We can have a comprehensive uh, management plan for the patient. Yeah. So maintaining general health and physical activity is very important, even if you have advanced prostate cancer. Because universally speaking, patients who are fit, who can do exercise, and who will continue to have active mind will fare far better as compared to someone who is frail and have a depressive mindset when they have a, with a, a, comp a comparable stage of disease. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, Dr. T. I think um, it was also a very uh, comprehensive uh, message to uh, our patients. Uh, hopefully that we have more cats, pussy cats than tigers in our group, right? In terms of uh, survival rate, right? And also, um, this another message I'd like to highlight is um, hopefully that uh, H. Hospital Sarawak will get the new uh, Robert uh, as soon as possible for the benefit of our patients. Thanks. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Ng. Right, one minute. Ah. Let me share screen first. Okay, great. Um, this is our last uh, speakers for the day, um, which is equally important uh, in terms of looking at um, IKN because uh, we hear so much of IKN and yet we know so little about IKN, right? Um, just to give a brief in introduction of uh, Dr. Ng, uh, Dr. Ng is currently the Nuclear Medicine Department uh, head and he's also a, a clinical consultant nuclear medicine physicians uh, in IKN. Um, before that, he was also uh, the head of the nuclear medicine services uh, with the Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Ng was uh, graduated from Kastuba Medical uh, College uh, in 1994, right? And he attained his MRCP uh, in, 20, uh, in 1990. So um, he has um, a lot of awards, one of which is an award on the United Nations International Atomic Energy Fellowship, which he was trained in the field of uh, nuclear medicines back in uh, 1990 uh, in London. And also again in 2007, uh, he got his fellowship in PET and CT scan uh, in uh, Sydney. Um, upon his return from UK, uh, he works uh, with the uh, nuclear divisions, nuclear medicines divisions in uh, HKL. And in 2002, he was posted to uh, JB uh, on the nuclear medicines uh, divisions. And subsequently, he was transferred back to uh, National Cancer Institution, Putrajaya in 19. Uh, Dong has a long standing interest in nuclear cardiology and has recent year, uh, years in taking interest in clinical applications on internal dosimetry and also paranostic in nuclear oncology. Uh, of course, it also touches on prostate cancer as well. He's the chairperson for the Specialty Subcommittee for Nuclear Medicines, National Specialty Registry of Malaysia and Country Coordinator of IAEA and uh, RCA project in targeted radio nuclear uh, therapy and also uh, uh, paranostic applications. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Ng. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Wong and all the participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
So uh, I was presenting uh, nucle nuclear medicines, the role of nuclear medicines in the management of uh, prostate cancer. And uh, I suppose uh, when we, before we, st uh, uh, before we start, I have no conflict of interest to disclose with respect to these presentations. Uh, these are the topics I would like to touch upon, a brief introduction of nuclear medicine specialty, and our GPS for the tumor detections uh, mainly concentrate on the prostate cancer, and how we transform this into a smart bomb to bombard the prostate cancer cell, and when to use this GPS and the smart bomb in the management of prostate cancer, and a brief description on the process of uh, uh, radionuclide treatment targeted therapy for prostate cancer. We will first concentrate on the two, the first two points first. Uh, Dr. Te, uh, Dr. Ng, uh, you have uh, slides, uh, presentations to share. Oh, okay. Uh, you please share your, your slide, uh, share screen. Oh. Sorry? No, no problem. It's good. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Doesn't come in the screen. Uh, it's coming. It's a bit slow. Uh, it's coming in. Yep. Yep. So to yep. Focus, yep. you can see the slides now? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, we will continue with that. So allow me to introduce what nuclear medicine is all about. Uh, basically, when we talk about nuclear sorry basically when we talk about nuclear medicines the first thing we know we the first thing which appear in our mind is the mushroom crop after the nuclear bomb but actually uh, we can use the technology in medical field as well and when uh, people ask me which field i'm in and how is it related to the nuclear bomb? I said uh, people use nuclear to kill. I will aim for nuclear to heal. And in med medical science, uh, there are three fields which deal with radiations. One is uh, conventional radiology, in which everyone is very uh, uh, acquainted with that. Of course, the next one is radiotherapy. And the third one is nuclear medicines. The specialty of nuclear medicines deal with unsealed source, in which frequently we use radioisotope in, in the form of liquid or even gases to help us in the management of diseases. And the radioisotope that we use, because they are unstable, so they are emitting out the radiations. And basically, they are three, they are four types of radiations we can emit out, the gamma ray and the X-ray. The gamma ray and the X-ray is the one in which we use for imaging. The beta and the alpha ray is, tends to travel in short distance, but with that traveling, emit a lot of radiations and energy and tends to be quite disruptive for the, along the distance that they have traveled. In nuclear medicines, if I want to study the functions, the act functional activity of the bone, I will inject something which stuck to the bone cell. If I want to study the heart, then I will use some things which stick up by the heart muscle cell. If I like to study the blood flow to the lung, then I will use some things which go along that route. And if I want to study the airway of the lung, I will give something for the patients to inhale in order to study the functional aspect of the airway. So it depends on what I really want to study. But basically, we concentrate on getting no better on the functional, the metabolic, or even the molecular status, how our body handles those molecules. What about nuclear medicine in oncology? In oncology, we know that the normal cell undergoes mutations and 
it will go through a series of mutations and become more and more aggressive and difficult to control in terms of their growth. And one of the molecule that one of the molecule that they use is glucose as a source of energy. And if at all we can tag a radioisotope with this glucose, basically it would have allowed me to detect those abnormal cells which take up high uptake of glucose in the body. After that, if I put the patients in the scanner to pick up the radiation which is emitted out and I can get a good image on what happened in the organ or cell in the body. In short, it is something like our GPS. We have all the satellites to pick up the signal emitted from our cell phone, handphone, and by analyzing the time lapse between that, we can draw out where it has come from on the map. Similarly, for PET CT machines, if we pick up the radiations emitted out from a radioisotope and we scan the patients across, and bravo, we get the picture of the activity, metabolic activity in the body. Usually, in, nuclear met in PET CT, we will combine it together with a CT component so that it will allow us to detect the positions and locations inside the body. For example, in this slide, we saw a highly illuminated focal in the body. We want to know where it has arise from. We overlap with your CT image and we can localize the image precisely at the location. Unfortunately, unfortunately, prostate cell, prostate cancer does not like to take up glucose. And they do not use glucose predominantly over the course of the disease. And it is only in the late stage when they become very aggressive, that they pick up the glucose. So naturally, we cannot rely on the glucose to detect its whereabouts. Back in 1993, people discovered that there is a glycoprotein, there is a protein which is overexpressed by the prostate cancer cell, and we call it prostate-specific membrane antigen. And we find that in prostate cancer, the more aggressive it is, the more, uh, the higher is this uh, glycoprotein present on the membrane of the prostate cancer cell. Now, just like COVID disease, the uh, COVID virus, if we know there is some things over their membrane, can we develop some peptide or antibody to find where is it? So in 1993, we find the PSMA, thanks to link up with that. And we start to ask ourselves, can I link up with a radioisotope so that I can get something and trace where it has traveled and resided for the prostate cancer. We also take notes that once this link up with this antigen, it undergoes a process called internalization. The cell will bring both the PSMA and the antigens into the cell. And that gives further advantage to it. And here, if the radioisotope that we link up start to emit out the signal and we pick it up, we can detect any abnormal site, tissue or cell which pick up this tracer and that tells us a lot on the whereabouts of the prostate cancer cell. 
So in the diagram below, you can in the diagram above for the normal, you can see quite an intensity, even in normal situations, quite an intensity is picked up by salivary gland. And any excess which doesn't bind to the body will be thrown out through the kidney, through the bladder, and out from the body. But in case of any metastasis or spread of the disease or any presence of the prostate cancer cell, you can see you will start picking up. It can be in the lymph nodes, in the soft tissue, or even in the bone itself. Here is another example in which we pick up that the prostate cancer cell has spread involving up until the thorax or the chest, inside the chest wall. Again, you can see multiple sites of uptake denoting that the cancer cell has spread and from there it is giving out signal for us to pick it up. And again, just like COVID, uh, in management of COVID, when we find some antigens, everyone will start rushing to find the peptides to link up with that glycoprotein present in the membrane. These are the, these are the um, peptides that we develop, that, hum, uh, that we have developed trying to pick up that antigens in the prostate. Of note, more established is the PSMA11. With PSMA11, we run a study and we take note that PSMA has 27 greater accuracy than the conventional imaging, either bone scan or CT scan to pick up any metastasis. Now, if we combine it with the MRI, we take note that other than local recurrence within the prostate itself, to pick up local regional metastasis or spread, this PSMA is much more superior than other modality. So you can see that MRI is good at picking up local prostatic tumor whereas PSMA scan is superior to pick up any spread of the disease from the prostate gland. Not surprisingly, FDA has approved the PSMA uh, imaging drugs on December last year. And within just a few months, another type of PSMA drugs has been approved in May this year. So you can see that hopefully by now you can, uh, you can understand what is PET CT about and what is between the glucose, FDG and PSMA, which has different role and not just with the word PET CT scan, we should always be specified what we are using, whether FDG, we can pick up 90% of most of the cancer, whereas PSMA is quite specific for prostate purpose. Now we look into the depth again, how we can transform this into a smart bomb. Now, from a diagnostics tool, how can I start to make a smart bomb? Just now, I said we use the gallium, which emit the gamma radiations to localize and image the prostate metastatic uptake. And that gallium is emitting us the gamma radiations to be picked up for imaging purpose. What if, what if I change it to lutetium-177? We know that lutetium is emitting beta particles, which kill, which tend to kill the cell along its way. And the best part is with hello. Now, hello, uh, hello. Uh, 
And what is best is with the process of internalization. It brings the, met, the peptides with the radioisotope closer to the DNA and with the radiations emitting out from that lutetium PSMA is going to break the DMA and cause the cancer cell death. Well, this is an example that uh, we can see that before the treatment, there's multiple extensive metastasis in the body. And with PSMA radio ligands treatments, which link up with the lutetium-177, we are bombarding exact locations of the tumor cell and cause quite a drastic changes even in the mid-cycle of the regime, treatment regime. This is another example where patients has practically exhausted all the treatment modality. He has taken the best possible standard of care, but the disease continued to progress as shown by the imaging scan. And the clinicians decided to treat it with PSMA treatments. And with passing of times, you can see how much the PSA has dropped with disappearance of the disease site, metastatic site. And again, this is pre and the post. And uh, there is medical uh, study trial done, which show that it can improve the life expectancy of the patients, although not much, but most importantly, improve the quality of life of patients, especially during the later part of the prostate cancer stage. And again, not surprisingly, after approval from the imaging site, for the therapeutic sites, the FDA has granted a breakthrough therapy designations and put it under priority review in September this year for this treatment modality. Those drug or medication which was put under priority review usually will be reviewed within six months time to decide whether it can get any approval FDA approval or not. Now, another story come in. If I can use radioisotope which emit beta particles, is it possible that I use alpha particles? I know that alpha particles travel shorter distance of time, a shorter distance and release more energy to break up the DNA and cause more death to the, to the tumor cell. And indeed, people has used alpha emitter particles, radio particles, uh, actinium 2 to 5. And you can see the result here. Despite twice using lutetium, which does not give any good response, after using alpha particles, change it to actinium 2 to 5, you can see the progress of the disease improvement. So the next thing is, when should I use this GPS? When should I use this smart bomb in the management of prostate cancer? From time to time, we receive requests asking to do a PET CT. And it was taken that it is FDG PET CT. But having a more detailed Betting on the request, actually, it shouldn't be asking for FDG PET CT. It should be a PSMA PET CT scan. Now, this PSMA PET CT scan should be used for biopsy proven prostate cancer imaging. It should not be used as a screening test. It can be used in patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer, especially those with high risk just like Dr. Tay has highlighted, recent score, seven or more, 
the tumor to be or more, and PSA more than 20 nanograms per mil or more, those are those high risk patients in which the disease may have spread when it was first diagnosed to have prostate cancer. Another instance where they, we can use it is when we find there is a elevated PSA level in which there's good reason to suspect that they might be recurrent or metastasis. And we would like to find out more about the status of disease times progress. Now, there are, we also use it for planning for PSA may therapy purpose. Next instances is when, despite MRI guided biopsy, you can still, you, uh, the surgeon might still not be able to localize the site of the disease inside the prostate gland itself, then perhaps this might be helpful for them to localize the site of disease to see where they should get their biopsy from. If we look into the disease progressions of prostate cancer, we can see that when prostate cancer is first diagnosed and we institute a primary therapy, the PSA level will drop drastically. But with passing of times, if at all, there is a progression of this disease with, multi, uh, with recurrence or metastasis, then it will start picking up again. We take note that if it's still in the hormone sensitive uh, period, hormonal deprivations can control the disease and bring the PSA down again. But again, with passing of times, it will come raise up again, and we have to consider different type of treatment modality in the in the management of advanced prostate cancer. So basically, according to the natural disease progression of the disease, we can more or less divide the prostate cancer into a hormone sensitive period and a castrate resistant period. And the role of PSMA imaging occur at this point, at the time of diagnosis, in which you want to stage the disease, you, know, you want to know how extensive is the disease could be. At the times when the PSA level start picking up, and you have reason to suspect that there could be metastasis. We know that it is much more sensitive than CT scan, bone scan, or even MRI to locate metastatic disease. And again, despite hormonal treatment, again, it pick up again. That is also the time to start tracing it where, where it has occurred. And of course, in the beginning, if we know that the disease has not spread and we can stop, our management can stop or halt and bring about a cure, that is the best timing for decision making. So PSMA is important, imaging is important for decision making. When the disease shows certain signs of metastasis again, if we can pick up early, and if at all during that time, the metastasis involved, let's say, very few lymph nodes, or we tend to call it oligometastatic disease. And nowadays with advanced technology, like what uh, Dr. Ibrahim has highlighted, uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy, we can even burn up that nodal metastatic site and hopeful for a cure at this stage. Another area where this PSMA imaging can be used is when we plan to do a therapy site. When the best standard of care has failed, everything you use has failed, and yet you are hoping to burn out whatever metastatic disease that have appeared, 
this is the time where we can use PSMA therapy. And because we are going to combine the therapy and the diagnostic, this is frequently called theranostic. Over the years, in the last decades, there are so many studies which has been done or in the process to uh, prove the point of the benefit during this treatment period, during this time of uh, disease. But at the same time, currently, there are multiple trials which are trying to study whether PSMA treatment could be effective in different phase of the disease process or not. So the ball is not all out yet, but we do know that during the late phase, it is effective for the treatment. Now, a brief description on the process of PSMA targeted therapy. Usually, patients would be in the state of metastatic castrated resistant prostate cancer, meaning that most of the known standard care and medications and treatments has failed. Usually, we will do a PSMA study to localize the tumor. At the same time, we also will do a FDG PET scan study. As I mentioned just now, FDG will be picked up in late phase of the disease, in the fin final late phase of the disease. And our purpose doing these two studies is to compare the tumor load and tumor character. For example, if we find that the PSM is uh, uptake, the tumor load is big and the FDG uptake aggressive tumor is less, then there is a good prospect of uh, good prospect of good response. If the inverse come around, we know that we should not use this modality of treatment. And this, the finding will be brought to a multidiscipline tumor board for discussions to arrive at a decisions. And patients, if at all, it is agreeable that patients should go through the PSMA therapy, then patients will be subjected to a series of investigations to make sure that he fulfill the criteria of such treatment before we even kickstart the treatment. Since the drugs has not been approved by the health ministry, we need to get clearance from the director general of health. And with his clearance, then only we can start the order and purchase of radioisotope and the preparation kits for it. On the day of treatment, we will prepare, do the compounding and laboring of the prostate. We need to make sure that the process of laboring is of good quality, successful, usually more than 95% of the, uh, the priority before we can administer to the patients. And usually not much acute side effect we can expect in the first few days. And we will follow up for any delayed toxicity, especially to the bone marrow, to the kidney, and to the salivary glands, as I pointed out just now, because so, uh, dryness of mouth is the frequent complaint after this treatment. Patient will go through four to six cycles of treatment to achieve final result. So in summary, to put it short, these are the things to bring back, hopefully. PSMA's imaging is used for biopsy-proven prostate cancer imaging, and FDG pet -CT is hardly used for prostate scan. So do not refer us for FDG pet -CT scan for prostate cancer. Two, 
PSMA scan is indicated for any newly diagnosed prostate cancer, especially those in the high risk category, for example, Gleason score seven or more, the tumor stage is P2B or more, or the PSA level is 20 or more. Of course, sometimes it also depends on individual if there are good reason to suspect that there is possibility of metastasis, nodal metastasis, or even bone metastasis, even without that risk factor, you, uh, we can use the PSMA imaging scan to stage the disease. At any point of time during the treatment and management, when we take notes that there is an elevated PSA level, initial spike of elevated PSA level, and there's suspicions of metastasis, that is also the time where we can request for PSMA scan. And just before any planning of PSMA treatment purposes. And treatment for PS using PSMA can be considered for castrated resistant prostate cancer, a late stage of the disease, at least at this moment, and until and unless it is proven it to be effective in the earliest disease stage. With that, thank you. And just a good saying of what makes a good doctor. A good doctor should know what to do. A good a doctor should know what to do. A good doctor know when to do, but the best doctor know when not to do. With that, thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ng. Um, a very good lecture. After hearing from what you say, it looks like uh, nuclear medicine, like it or not, will be part and parcel of uh, prostate cancer management. Um, great. We have all the three uh, important speakers who have um, um, shared their experience with us. Uh, now is uh, the uh, Q&A time. Uh, Dr. can you please uh, uh, unshare your screen? Okay, wait. It's okay. I, I, I can stop yours. No problem. I, I did it. Yeah. Okay, our next session will be a Q&A time. Uh, actually, a lot of questions have been raised uh, by our members. Um, uh, hopefully, that uh, all the questions will be answered uh, by our fellow uh, three uh, speakers. Okay. Um, the first question. Oh yeah, sorry, I, I had to remove this. Otherwise, I don't know who is who. <laughs> One minute. Lah. Yes, okay, I remove it. Okay, first question um, is uh, for Tato Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, this is raised by uh, Mr. Albert Liu. Uh, the question is, um, the PACE 1 study talks about uh, triplet therapy. That is ATT plus uh, Texatoxyl apilotron for high volume disease. Is this therapy adopted uh, in uh, your practice? And second, patients with high volume bone metastasis is having texatoxyl every two weeks. Schedule for 10 rounds, but PSA raised two points after each infusion. Pre toxidexyl PSA 16 after four rounds of toxidexyl, PSA become uh, 24. Alkaline uh, phosphate taste is dropping from 200 to uh, 98. Patience is uh, pretty young and fit and blood uh, works is good. What will be your, uh, I mean, what, what, what will you do to stop the chemo? Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. we can hear you. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, right. I think with regards to PEACE 1 study, this is a very new study that was uh, recently published in uh, ESMO uh, and ESCO uh, this year. So, you know, with every new development and all that, number one, uh, we like to work, wait for a little bit of maturity of the data. But having looked at the initial or preliminary data, I think this study is potentially a game changer for us in managing prostate cancer. So I'm very, very uh, excited about this data. 
and and certainly um, you know we will uh, for when we find suitable patients uh, we will certainly uh, discuss uh, about uh, using triplet therapy for patients with uh, metastatic uh, uh, prostate cancer now the other thing also like i mentioned earlier on uh, the affordability of because they are now uh, generics available for uh, these drugs uh, so uh, hopefully the cost uh, will not be prohibitive at one time uh, when we were using uh, drugs like aviaterone the cost is uh, per, you know per box is you know well over uh, 10000 ringgit but now it's uh, you can get it below 5000 ringgit with a generic and even the cost of originating drugs have come down in price yes certainly this is something uh, we will be adapting for suitable patients the second question uh, high volume uh, bone mats with docetaxel done four cycles of chemo okay my advice is sometimes in, when we give docetaxel and sometimes we give chemotherapy it takes a little bit of time for things to work yes the psa is going up uh, normally i tell my patients uh, please be be patient uh, because you know wait for a few more cycles uh, but this is something you need to discuss with your doctors. Now, if the PSA is going up very steeply, going up uh, exponentially, then, okay, you know, we might need to think about changing. But after four doses, it's going up a little bit. But more importantly, the alkaline phosphatase is dropping. The question I ask is, is the patient getting better? You know, how do I find out whether, okay, I ask patient, the pain, is it, better or not, the joint, uh, joint pain, bone pain, is it getting better? Another simple thing to look at is, is the patient putting on weight? You know, If the patient is putting on weight, doing very well, uh, improving his quality of life, then I would not bother about the PSA, uh, uh, watching the rise in PSA so much, but looking at the symptomatic improvement. Sometimes I've seen patients even after the chemotherapy, only then the PSA drop. You know, so, so it might drop even many months after and you may not see that. So, so yes, you, you can do that. Uh, of course, the other uh, thing that you can do if you've done a, a baseline PSMA scan, uh, after about you know, three months, four months, uh, we can do another PSMA scan uh, to see uh, uh, the difference in PSMA. So, so if you've done a PSMA, sometimes I will look at the activity and as long as I don't see any new lesions and I see an improvement of activity in the, old, uh, in the current lesions, I would still continue. Now, if there is true disease progression, then there are drugs that we can give, uh, second line drugs uh, 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 like Carbizotexel, Kabi, Kabi, and also, uh, like I mentioned earlier on, looking at some of the biomarkers, uh, looking at the BRCA, BRCA genes. Okay, thanks, uh, Tato. Uh, we go to the next question. Yeah, my internet is unstable. My next question. My next question is uh, to uh, Dr. Ng. Okay. Uh, can a patient walk into the, the uh, into the uh, hospitals uh, for scanning with uh, only a referral letter, or you only accept referral letters uh, sent by the respective hospital? Uh, basically, under Ministry of Health, we have only two PET CT centers. One is in IKN, another one is in Hospital Pulau Pinang. We list we list the PET CT machine from Institute Cancer, uh, sorry, uh, IJN Institute Jantung Negara as well. But out of these three serve, uh, center of service, we we only do PSMA in IKN, and uh, we only receive uh, patients who are ref, uh, who are referred by IJN uh, doctors. For those patients who want to walk in with 
a private uh, a referral letter from a private hospital, they will be charged uh, in a very high amount, uh, very high amount up until seven thousand for the scan. So it is why why be here? Sorry, sorry, there's disturbance. Okay, I all right. Hello. Hello. Okay, can continue. Sorry, there's disturbance yet. Oh, okay. Uh, where am I? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the uh, cost. Uh, Doctor Ng, how much is the cost? Can you come back again? How much is the price? If 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 you bring in a reference letter from a private hospital and ask to get the PSMA done in IKN, it costs seven thousand ringgit. Wow. Oh. And uh, that is because that is because you will be put under the category of private patient. Oh. We are trying to work out we are trying to work out a full paying patient scheme for IKN in which the fees will be revised to something more acceptable. The last thing I know is it is on it is on for discussion by the cabinet. I do not know when it will get approved. I do not know when it will get approved, but I believe a, a feedback and a support by the NGO will be important. Uh, okay. Other things I would like to add on on uh, Dr. Ibrahim's comment, uh, Dr. Dr. Ibrahim's comment is, first of all, when you order the PSMA scan, please do not change the treatment yet. Because if you have changed the treatment and there is a physiological or functional or metabolic change in the team, we not, might not be able to pick up so sensitively the PSMA. After all, it is responsive to your treatment. So you change the treatment after you have done the PSMA scan. The second thing is we do not advocate to use PSMA scan as a biomarker imaging scan because the reason why you start the treatment and you use the PSA for monitoring, continue to do so because it is much more cost effective when a PSMA scan are so costly, even in the private sector, the cheapest that I know is 3000 plus. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Ng. The next question we have is uh, for Dr. Tay. Uh, the question is, patients just saw the urologist uh, at UMMC. His PSA was 7.5. The story was he had an MRI done uh, on his prostate last year. And after some time, the PSA uh, only at 6.4. But to play safe, the doctor asked him to do some bi uh, biopsy tests in uh, July this year, which uh, the biopsy was clear, no malignancy. Just six months of monitor. Today, the doctor said PSA went up to 7.5 and asked to monitor three months, then uh, come back to do another MRI. MRI. He was advised to take this uh, tablet, uh, HANA, uh, Oscar, which is a uh, Tomsulucin, mm. right? Anything that he need to do to observe uh, in the meantime? First of all, <coughs> I think we need to know how old is the patient now? This uh this patient uh the age is not stated here. I think it's about uh is senior citizen. <laughs> but it's very important to say you can see what I my presentation. Uh yeah. PSA or six point four or seven point five in a different age of group people have different meaning. So if it's uh, let's say this is sixty five years old, of course then he, he need to worry uh, about prostate cancer possibility. But he already had one round of biopsy which is negative, and I believe his MRI is also negative, right? No, uh Dr. Tay. I just saw his MRI is Pirate 4. Pirate 4. Oh, okay. That's very important information. Yeah. Pirate 4, then if it is a Pirate 4, you have a negative biopsy, then we have to ask ourselves what kind of biopsy strategy was done on him. Is it a targeted biopsy? Has it, uh, how many calls was taken from the total biopsy? 
That one is important because if the biopsy is a cognitive fusion, that means that the radio, the, the urologist look at the MRI and then he draw on the platform, a uh, template of the prostate to locate visually only, not on by software, where the lesions are supposed to be. And then he try to place the needle to that area. So that is called cognitive fusion. That means you fuse the image of MRI in your brain and then try to transfer it onto the ultrasound. Of course, this is uh, less accurate as compared to software based which I show you earlier on, on either the BioBots or on the Coelis or any other uh, brand in the market. But it's important to know whether the target has been hit or not. And you can see from the precision trial, uh, if you have a PRAP4, your chances of having a prostate cancer is nearly way above 50%. So now, his PSA is not uh, going up uh, terribly fast from my uh, view, 6.4, 7.5. So he still can observe because you already have a negative biopsy. So take away the MRI. If you have a negative biopsy, the chances for you miss a prostate cancer is still about 20%. Yeah, that is not diagnosed, a significant cancer. So either you can take the advice of the, get another look at the biopsy strategy they have undergone before, and he can uh, undergo another biopsy with a few uh, template, uh, soft software fusion biopsy if that has not been done. Uh, this medicine that he treated with is for his uh, urinary symptoms. It has no impact on prostate cancer diagnosis or anything. Yeah. Okay, so, thanks Dr. Tay. The next question uh, is back to Tato Ibrahim. Tato Dr. Ibrahim uh, is by James Tay. The question is, patients detected prostate cancer early this year, MRI, uh, biopsy, and also bone scan, uh, all this have been done. Cancer prognosis was localized aggressive. PSA was 12. He was on nuclear injection twice. Uh, PSA now is 0.11. Uh, next is he has to go undergo radiotherapy for 22 fractions as recommended. Uh, next he has to do a CT simulation. And what is CT simulation? I think it was, it was already been uh, highlighted. If PSA now is below 4, is it necessary for R, uh, RT uh, to avoid side effect? Uh, nuclear injection uh, causes back ache and weak leg and bones. How to overcome this problem? Okay, um, I think there are a number of points here. Number one, uh, you know, I think it's uh, difficult to comment on individual cases uh, without actually uh, seeing the patient themselves. And I sometimes I feel that it's also not right for me to comment on specific cases managed by other doctors. Uh, number two, yeah, uh, okay, what is CT simulation? Uh, I mentioned, now before you undergo radiotherapy, uh, we need to do something called a planning. Basically, what you need is, is you need to take uh, the anato an anatomy uh, of the patient. So we do a CT scan, so we know where the prostate is, where the rectum is, where the bladder is and uh, where the other organs are uh, so that then the oncologists uh, we people like us will do the contouring so we do you know we, we will draw the the targets uh, the prostate or the lymph nodes uh, when necessary and then after we've drawn all that then they will go through a planning uh, machine and the planning physicists will will do the calculation so CT simulation is an important process. In fact, it's a compulsory process uh, when we undergo radiation treatment because that's where we get the anatomical and contour of the patient. Now, now the next question about PSA below five, is it necessary? I think you should talk to your doctors. Now, bearing in mind, when you undergo uh, hormonal treatment, especially in a young patient, um, you know, hormone treatment eventually can become resistant. So, you know, so if you just give hormonal treatment alone, at some point in time, especially in a young patient, the patient may develop hormonal resistance and then you get disease progression. And then from disease progression, you will change the patient from early treatable prostate cancer to a non to a, to a, a sort of a metastatic disease. So sometimes when you have localized treatment, I think that the prostate, uh, the hormone was given because the, the, 
the tumor may be locally advanced and the oncologist is trying to downstage it. So, so uh, um, you know, so I think um, if the plan is already to start the radiotherapy, I think it's best to discuss with your, your doctors. Uh, the question about Lucrin, yes, Lucrin can sometimes uh, uh, cause uh, side effects uh, uh, like uh, uh, joint pain, aching, generalized bone pain. Um, uh, but I think when you say weakness in your legs, I think that one we need to check properly because is it a drug-related effect or is it something that is happening? Um, you know, if there might be a, a, a tumor uh, infiltrating uh, 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 the bones uh, and, and causing something called a, a spinal cord or cauda equina uh, compression. So there might be tumor erosion. So we have to make sure that this is not a, a metastatic disease. Okay, rather than, you know, but like I say, the, it's very unusual to get a weakness in the legs. Yeah, I mean, overcoming, you know, again, uh, you need to discuss with your doctors whether, you know, if, if Lucrin is not, um, uh, you know, uh, agreeing with you, you, you know, you might need to change uh, the hormonal uh, therapy. Uh, that I think something, again, you best to discuss with your doctor. Okay, uh, thanks, Tato. The, the next question, uh, back to Dr. Tay, is by Joshua Kua. What is the next steps after MRI and biopsy in, uh, done in April? The result is negative. And PSA, as of today, goes up to 10.4 from previous. Okay, this is uh, not an uncommon scenario, in fact. And... Uh... Many times after you have done an MRI, if, especially if you see, a, I believe the MRI was abnormal. Yeah, they must have a period lesion, maybe four or five. And if you have a negative biopsy, then again, you have to go back to like what I, we discussed earlier on. But of course, this patient PSA now is a higher, 10.4. So it's above 10. So I believe this patient will need to undergo another round of biopsy in this particular situation. But again, is the, the information like this, we do not know how old is the patient, whether it's fit or not, and then whether you got other uh, comorbidity. And uh, of course, with bear in mind is the result. How are we going to deal with the result? The result come up, come up as positive. Eh? So that will determine our decision as to how aggressive we want to biopsy the patient. The next biopsy strategy for this kind of patient who are MRI positive, but targeted biopsy, let's say you have done a fusion biopsy, uh, software based, but you still cannot detect the cancer and the patient is young and is very worried about missing out on early aggressive prostate cancer. Then the patient need to undergo a transperineal uh, kind of like a saturation biopsy where they will get the multiple calls and then um, they're basically called template based prostate biopsy. But this usually need to be done under general anesthesia and there are some significant uh, Potentially some uh, side effect like uh, retention of urine, bleeding, and then uh, using a catheter and uh, discomfort. So th th those are the consideration. Yeah, but I think this patient, uh, you know, is worrying. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Tay. And, and for the participants, if you have any questions, you can uh, type onto the chat. Okay. So uh, we'll get through all the pre preset questions. If the time, you'll go through the uh, chat questions. All right. Uh, the next one is for Dr. Ng. Uh, long questions, right? Um, uh, is by uh, Mr. Key. Question one is nuclear medicine therapy is very expensive, I think, which you have highlighted just now. And usually it's out of reach by most patients. What's the cost involved in IKN? And does the MOH extend certain forms of monetary assistance like subsidy, aids uh, for the common citizens, all right? Uh, question number two is, what criteria or requirement imposed on uh, prostate cancer patients to be eligible for nuclear medicine therapy? Is such therapy suitable for early stage of uh, prostate cancer patients? And um, the, the third question is, what are the advantages of uh, nuclear medicine therapy as compared to other radiation therapy approach currently practiced and used? And the last question is, will what are the side effects affects nuclear medicines? Uh, is it less as compared to other forms of treatment? 
Uh, Dr. Ng? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, for question one, uh, yes, nuclear medicine therapy, PSME therapy is very expensive. Uh, the cost of the PSM therapy itself with lutetium iradioisotopes will be a minimum of 17 to 18,000. And the regime is four cycle at least. So you can see with all the added costs together, one, one full regime would have cost up nearly to 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, for for government policy, for government policy, uh, if if it is a pensioner, government pensioner, and if the multidiscipline uh, committee uh, have the opinion that this is the uh, treatment that is left for him, then as usual, he can apply for uh, reimbursement from the government. But from, for private patients, uh, at this current moment, we do not have such, uh, such scheme for private patients. Uh, of course, another thing we can explore is a full paying patient scheme, meaning that uh, private patients come in to be treated in the government facilities with, uh, with a cost which uh, the Ministry of Health always aim to be at least slightly cheaper than the private uh, institution, in the private institutions. But as I highlighted just now, to the best that I know from a recently retired high officer, is on the table, not approved yet. Uh, perhaps uh, Society of uh, Prostate Cancer can do some pushing for this. For well, question number two, uh, which criteria or requirement imposed on P, uh, PCA uh, patients to be eligible? Uh, to just like I have highlighted uh, just now, it is a castrated resistant uh, metastatic prostate cancer. At this current moment, study has shown that it is beneficial for that category. If it is used for earlier stage of prostate cancer, all I can say is has yet to be proven. The efficacy has yet to be proven. Now, question number three, what the, what the advantages of nuclear medicine therapy as compared to other radiation therapy approach currently practiced and used? Again, the answer is still the same. Usually it is multiple metastatic has occurred where radiotherapy, uh, radi radiotherapy is no longer feasible for considerations. Uh, that is the stage where we consider our smart bomb of bombarding the, the tumor cell with our radioisotope. Uh, were the, the last question, were the adverse side effects of nuclear medicine therapy less? Uh, at this current moment, uh, the most disturbing side effect will be the effect of a delayed effect of drive mouth. Other like reduce platelet, reduce red, red, red blood cell and things like that, we find that we find that it will somehow recover over time. So at this current moment, the most disturbing side effect to the patient is dry mouth. Delayed late effect is dry mouth. That's all. Thank you. Uh, uh, since we are touching on the cause uh, for this treatment, um, does the uh, insurance company uh, helps in terms of a co-payment? Uh, at this current moment, I do not think that it is, I, I, I do not uh, exactly know whether it is covered by the insurance scheme or not. But we did encounter problems, we did encounter problems that sometimes when patients approach us and they want us to give a full bill in one, sorry, uh, a clean amount in one single full bill. And we know that this medication is expensive and patient has to foot themselves for this medication. It is not, un and the hospital under Ministry of Health cannot purchase on behalf of the patients. So somehow you will come in as two bills. One is 
specifically buy, buying this radioisotope and radio uh, uh, molecule for treatment. Another one is hospital bill. So at this current moment, we only know that insurance company do not accept the two bills separately. They want it in one full bill. Perhaps once that this uh, PSMA therapy treatment is started uh, under full paying patients, we can engage the insurance company for further discussion. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, let's go to the next question. The next question is back to uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Patient is 65 years old, currently treated by urologist. Uh, he was diagnosed with extensive bone mats with uh, PSA uh, 1,200. Patient is given nuclear injection with no other medication for nine months and the PSA dropped to uh, 230. His question is, what other standard care uh, treatments would be recommended? Should patient be continued to be treated with urologist or move to oncologist? At this age, do, does the patient need to put on some, some vitamins or calcium uh, to supplement? Uh... Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the standard of care treatment. Uh, remember, I think the first question asked by uh, uh, Albert Liu about the PEACE study, PEACE 1 study. I think, you know, like I say, it, it looks like a, a game changer. For somebody who is 65 years old, young patient with extensive bone metastasis, I think chemotherapy must be added into this equation. You know, uh, I think that, uh, the, you know, I think just giving uh, hormonal treatment alone, uh, I think within a few months, this patient is going to uh, progress and, 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 and become resistant. So I think in this sort of situation, I would certainly consider chemotherapy. Uh, that is, is, is really beyond, beyond question, uh, that the benefits of chemotherapy. And then plus or minus, you want to do... Um, uh, the, uh, adding abiaterone or, or, or look or radiation to the um, non-responding parts. So that's, uh, that's quite standard. Should the patient continue? This is a politically difficult uh, question to answer. And I think, you know, you, you should, you know, each, each of us play an important role. Uh, the urologist, the oncologist, the nuclear medicine specialist, we all play an important role. And normally, Cases like this, we you know, ideally uh, in in Western countries, it's all discussed in a multidisciplinary uh, board meeting, and then we we will you know the, the 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 multidisciplinary team will decide on 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 the best management for the patient, and and you know, so there are you know for for surgical treatment and some for early hormonal treatment. Yes, it's handled by urologists, but oncologists, we do other treatments like, like immunotherapy, uh, chemotherapy, uh, a pulp inhibitor. And I think there are evolving field of uh, a treatment in the field in, in metastatic prostate cancers, you know, immunotherapy, like I say, it's coming into the picture. And the third thing is also, I think I would like to add, uh, the patients got bone mats, I'd like to add either Exgiva or Zomita um, for, for the treatment of the bone metastases. And then uh, at this age, uh, uh, putting on vitamins, okay, yes, I mean, there's no harm, but I think you also have to watch your calcium level. If you don't want to put on calcium, if you have bone metastases, then you might have an increased risk of hypercalcemia. So you need to monitor your, 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 your calcium level. So if you have hypercalcemia and you, 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 you receive uh, and you're taking calcium, it's not good. But certainly when you're on Zomita or, or, or um, Exgiva, uh, the doctors may give you uh, calcium or, or vitamin D uh, to prevent hypocalcemia. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Dr. Prahim. The uh, next Steven, question. Steven, can yes, I, yes, can I uh, yes. speak a bit? I think this guy is quite young at 65 and uh, he has got a high PSA. Please, Dr. Tay can tell us something about the prevalence trial. Okay. Uh, I, uh, this guy. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I have to start. Yeah. 
Okay, continue, continue. Sorry, sorry. Okay, and I think okay. Uh, this is a high volume disease. Uh, we call it high volume disease and also high risk patient, most probably. So, high volume disease, uh, Dr. Ibrahim rightly pointed out that chemotherapy is uh, suitable for this group of patient. But I think if the patient, we, are not, we do not know the context as to why patient on the monotherapy. Sometimes there may not be acceptance for the initial for chemotherapy when the, during the initial discussion. But this thing need to be brought up with the patient, even though the patient don't accept it within the first uh, uh, initiation of ADT. So ADT alone is not enough. Enough. You have to be plus X, plus some things. Either abilatron, enzalutamide, apalutamide, or chemotherapy at this age, you know. You cannot just base on uh, uh, ADT alone in a fit patient. If the patient is um, fit for chemotherapy but yet do not want to have chemotherapy for various reasons or whatever fear that he has, then he should be uh, given oral agents, either abiratrons or enzalutamide or even apalutamide at this stage. Yeah, so I, I think the, the, the management of this particular patient is uh, pretty clear and uh, ADT alone probably is a uh, is, uh, 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 under treatment, I would say, although I would agree with Ibrahim, we do not want to comment on individual case based on limited intervention. But uh, everything being equal, the uh, patient should be receive a uh, double therapy at this age. Yeah. But uh, Dr. Tay, would you think that he might qualify for the uh, prevalence trial, prevalence study done by uh, Johnson & Johnson? Mm, if the trial is conducted by the oncologist, so I think we are urologists, we are, I'm not involved in that particular trials. So if the patient has no option, no option for self-purchase of the medication, then they can be enrolled uh, in that kind of trial in a hormone sensitive. But um, I think enrollment in trial also depends on the opportunity and uh, locality of the patient. Where is it? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, our next question, uh, Dr. Ng, I, uh, I think it's uh, uh, if I'm correct, the radiation uh, gamma 68 PSA scan, about half of that of the convention, uh, conventional imaging is because radiation exposure in uh, MSV. And how often is the uh, imaging apparatus in IKN uh, checked and calibrate, uh, calibrated to ensure this radiation well, value is maintained? Very good. Okay. Uh, okay. In regards to these patients, uh, now the radiation exposure for uh, PSMA PET CT scan is about 4 millisavier or 4 MSV. 4 millisavier. 4 millisavier is almost at par as someone who is doing a kidney kidney x-ray with contrast serial uh, IV you uh, I mean kidney x-ray for with contrast so you can see that the radiation exposure is low now just now as I, as I have highlighted PET scan usually add in with a CT scan CT scans will give a, another uh, radiation dose to the patient. In FKN, we practice low dose CT, non contrast CT scan, which will give another 4 millisavier, around 4 millisavier to the patient. So a PSMA, PET CT scan, will give a total of around 8 millisavier for, to the patients. Now, in the use and control of radiation dose to the patients, just like I have highlighted just now, and it can be used, uh, the principle can be used anywhere, the best doctor should know when not to do. Now, I know that even if I do diagnostic, fine slight CT scan, it's not going to give me any better advantage than the PET, uh, PSMA PET scan with low dose. So I'm not going to use the high dose fine slight CT scan. I also know that if I want to use a fine slight CT scan, I might as well order an MRI. So you should know, a good, uh, the best doctor should know which one to choose to get the best 
imaging results and to answer the questions lingering in the management of, of, the, of the patients. In the last statement, IKN has a good team of nuclear pharmacies and also nuclear physicists to double check on the machines, on the compounding process of the radio tracer. So we follow international standard protocol in our practice to ensure that the radiation dose is low to the best that we can offer. That's all. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ng. Um, one more question for Dr. Ng. This is by Aaron Heng. I had robotic surgery, removed my prostate gland in June 2019. I've monitored my PSA as follows. October, uh, 10 September 2019, uh, less than 0.1. Um, April is uh, 22, is uh, rise a bit to 0.05. And November 2020, uh, rise again to 0.3. Uh, 2021 uh, is uh, 0.29. And November 24, which is uh, very recent, is 0.3. How soon should I take a... Uh, uh, can you hear me? Oh, your line is not clear. I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's mine. A PET scan. Can, okay. can, can. And it makes sound of the, 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 the line is uh, quite, uh, quite weak. Yeah. Okay. I think you need to look at the final pathology of the specimen. Whether the patient have a, what is the recent score of the final pathology? Whether the margin is positive? What is the stage of the cancer, local cancer? Whether any leaf node has been removed? And if the limb node has been removed, was it positive or anything? I believe if the limb node has been removed, it would be negative la, by this, uh, looking at it. So looking at it, this is a BCR. La. This is a BCR. So it's already more than 0 0.2 and moving on to 0 0.4. So by strict definition, if you look at the conventional definition now, 0 0.4 and above, you consider BCR. Then you can start looking for metastasis. But I also show you what the PSMA can do in a patient even with a low PSA, very low PSA, but without a prostate. It's different from a patient with a prostate in place. So in this group of patients, if you do a PSMA PET, 50% will have a metastasis. Whether you find that out now, would it make any difference or not? Actually, if you are, you are preparing to do a, some, not to call a standard of care at this moment, but more of a exploratory or experimental in some center on even some of this practice is quite uh, routinely adopted in some academic center. They will do a metastatic directed therapy where they do a PSMA PET. If they find a lesion, they may want to chase those metastases and treat them with a local treatment rather than systemic treatment. If this option is on table, then you can choose to find out whether you have a meds or not. So 50% of the time, you will be able to pick up. But I would also want to uh, stress that PSMA doesn't detect every single prostate cancer uh, metastasis, in fact. So there will, you still can miss certain things. So do you need to do now or can you wait further? I think can continue to monitor, can continue to monitor. Yeah. But if the patient anxiety level is very high and he wants to start systemic therapy and he's very worried about that and the Gleason score was high and he has a high stage disease, from the radical prostatectomy specimen, then the chances of uh, having a, uh, a metastasis is high. Of course, if the absence of metastasis, let's say there's no metastasis, what can you do with a BCR like this? BSMA also negative. Naturally, you would want to consider uh, uh, early salvage, early salvage uh, radiotherapy for this uh, group of patient. Yeah. So if that's on the cut, then you should you should do a PSMA pen. It can help you to avoid uh, salvage in the presence of metastasis. Okay, hello, can I talk? I'm Aaron Heng. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm good. I guess my main, my main one uh, is because my uh, my internet is quite bad, quite bad here. Okay, 
Um, okay, Aaron, 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 want to continue. Aaron, what? Uh, put your video on, and what do you want to ask, Aaron Hing? Uh, uh, can take can take over because my my uh, internet is very poor here, right? Well, you have the questions, but now mind you, you mm. try to. Okay, so Aaron, go okay. ahead. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. Ah. Uh, my process has removed. Ah. Uh, my glycine score after the pathology report is ah uh, seven, sir. Mm -hmm. The glycine, I think seven. Yeah. So is the uh, margin is all negative? Ah. Uh, uh, not very sure about it. Not very sure about it. Huh? What was your PSA before you had your prostate removed, actually? Uh, it's actually gradually increased from four to six, ah. Uh. Um, six, yeah, So, uh, six. So it's the intermediate risk, uh, You will belong to the uh, intermediate risk, most probably, yeah. So I believe the lymph node has not been removed, lah. Uh, remove, lymph. remove. Remove lymph node also been done. Ah, uh, remove, yeah. Uh, part of it near the pelvis, I think. Yeah, yeah. say it remove, yeah. Ah, uh, Mulari, yeah. So yeah. I think you you can consider a P, P, uh, PSMA pads, yeah. If it's negative, yeah. of course, then you, you want to probably move on to an early salvage, yeah. Should I should I wait a bit longer or until okay. what uh, PSA score then I go? Um, I think you still can wait as long as you don't do it uh, beyond zero point five. I think because of, because the salvage radiotherapy, the result is the earlier you do it, the better. Oh, yeah. Okay. Salvage radiotherapy. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, I, think, uh, I think we have uh, uh, taken uh, three hours already. Okay. And, Thank uh, you very much, okay. doctor. And uh, are they? I let's have a let last uh, two questions, please, from from the from all of you. Anybody who, who can you just speak up, unmute yourself, and speak up. Last two questions, please. Is there anybody, if you just unmute and pick up, that will do. Uh, Kwan Singh, Kwan Singh. Yes, let's go ahead, Albert. I don't have a question for Dato uh, Ibrahim, but okay. I want to thank you, Dato. Because in the last meeting in November, exactly one year from now, uh, uh, since then, you have given us a discount for the PSMA PET scan from 5,005 to 3,002. <laughs> we want to thank you for this, Dato. Don't, don't don't thank me. Thank um Mary Chen. Thank uh, Mary. Thank owner. Mary. Thank Mary. So, not, Mary not me. The, I only yeah. uh uh I think uh uh you know Mr Wong and 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 and, and you and a few others uh, from the society negotiated. So they they listen and they brought the price down to around three thousand two. Thank so, you. And for this year, for this year, can we ask something like Sunway is giving us a fifty percent discount? for radiotherapy if uh, we don't have any insurance okay can you follow something like 50 percent okay uh, that would for, be great yeah okay for radiotherapy we do have a csr fund yeah we have a csr fund and based on the csr we do give patients uh, uh subsidized treatment now so so when you say about like like 50 percent yeah, sometimes we give 50%, sometimes we give 80%. That depends on the patient's uh, uh, affordability. Sometimes we've even given patients free treatment. So what I would suggest again, maybe this time the society can again approach our CSR team and perhaps for referral cash paying patient, we can negotiate like a, a special rate lah for, for the society members. Yes, that's uh, uh, always. We are always open to assisting patients who are in need and and who who we feel will benefit from treatment, and 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 we shouldn't say no to people uh, who uh, uh, you know who needs treatment, uh, and and you know and we cannot just close the door and turn them away. No, we will treat them, uh, and we will make sure that uh, even though they can't afford we will make the treatment affordable or even give them free treatment. So please approach our hospital, our CSR team and start negotiating again. You might yeah. be successful. I'm sure you will be successful. Yeah, you, actually we are, we are very grateful to, to Beacon Hospital because uh, they are also long, uh, have at the present moment have a pre-PSA test for four months, which is, which is very good. Uh, it's only one hospital that is doing that. That's number one. Number two, in fact, a beacon has uh, donated to our soon-to-be-launch uh, this uh, biker saying 
uh, for they donated. Uh, Mary has pledged uh, two thousand uh, ringgit for to us. Uh, really, uh, so far, uh, Beacon Hospital is is doing very well, and uh, they are doing a lot of this uh, discount for our members. And hopefully, uh, this will continue. And it will set a good example to our hospitals. That's very important, private hospitals. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I have another question, please? Okay. Uh, Guan Sui, can I have a question for Mr. Uh, Doctor Pei? Okay, Doctor Pei, uh, can you tell us uh, how much does a Da Vinci fifth generation uh, robot machine cost? <laughs> the machine is it? Uh, it's it's supposed to be monopolized by a company, as you know. Yeah. So in Malaysia, there's only one distributor. I think if you are at the management place for the hospital, then you have to direct negotiate with the company. Basically, is a uh, is. They do not have a listed price on the game, but what we are going to get for Sarawak General Hospital is a Da Vinci XI. The, so the model will come in a. The figure is a, about a, more than 10 million. Yeah. Okay, okay. 10 million ringgit or, or. Ringgit, ringgit or uh, US. Ringgit, ringgit. ringgit. Oh, that is not too bad. Yeah. Uh, uh, hey, hey, last, last question. Who is it? Can I ask uh, who's that? Question for Dr. Dr. Yeah. Dr. What, what are you going to do with your 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 mesh uh, your machine? Oh, which are you 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 are going to uh, freeze up? The machine already is dismembered already. Dismember. Oh, it's member. Economic repair. They may go to the graveyard. Yo. Unfortunately, no place to store them in hospital. Yeah. Do, do you mean this machine has a limited uh, service uh, life? Yes. You just they will, they will not support the machine beyond ten years. So oh. it's, it's expensive, but I think radiotherapy machine is even more expensive. Yeah. I, I okay. I I think uh we we are coming to the close. Uh, yeah. As I said, we uh we sorry that we take you so long about uh it will be about ten minutes over time which is yeah. reasonable. Um. Hey, thank you very much. But uh, I hope you guys uh, have picked up some of the important message. I think uh, I think all the, I think between uh, the speakers among the speakers they they agree that if you have advanced uh, prostate cancer, it's always you know hormone treatment plus X. In other words, you have to get RB or you know Enza or whatever, and uh, not not alone at all or chemo. And uh, also the other thing is that um, we have a Quite a number of our guys have under chemo. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Abra Ibrahim will agree with me that in fact, chemo uh, doxytaxel for prostate cancer is not that punishing like other chemo. So it's not that bad. I, so far, we have never come across one guy who had chemo and died. That's very important. No fatality rate. And we have 350 members, okay? So uh, we have a lot of uh, spread all over Malaysia. And we have never come across any guy who have chemo and died. So even uh, last time when I told Kim, I said, hey, why don't you try? And those guys said, uh, you know, you only recommend chemo to your friends, but not to yourself. <laughs> so you see, <laughs> so remember, if you come to a stage, you need chemo, to be brave enough. Oh yeah, Chosing has taken chemo. There you are. <laughs> that, uh, yes, the yeah, there are many people and Chosing is, uh, my gosh, he's my classmate and... Uh, he is about 76 now, and he just had chemo, I think he was 74. So now he's still uh, fit and strong. Okay, uh, the other thing is that um, I'm also very uh, happy that uh, I heard from uh, Dr. Ibrahim that the PEACE study will might be a grain changer. That means we have a triplet therapy, all the things combined. And then on top of that, we have generic mm -hmm. coming in. So it is not punishing in cost. I think that is very important, you know. Because uh, try to live longer and then, you know, the time will come that all these new treatment will have, will lengthen our lives. And as we are very senior citizen, uh, some, most of us are, you know, 70, 60s, over. So any prolonged, you know, any prolonging in survivorship is very important to us. You know, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for, for Abi. And why? Because in Malaysia, you know, because some of our patients here who have taken Arbitron acetate, some of them survive plus seven more years. That's very significant. And he was one of the first guy who take Arbi. 
Unfortunately, of course, he was a, was a very rich man and he could afford it. And uh, of course, he spent millions. So uh, anyway, uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, we, I'm also uh, very uh, encouraged about the SBRT use. That is, uh, we can even use, uh, uh, really, you know, uh, if you use even 37, 35 grays, is equal to 90 grays in the past. So that is very encouraging. And then also we have less tissue damages, you know, that is, uh, that is also um, good and, um, and higher curative rate. If I have, uh, you know, have my prostate cancer uh, later than I, I had, I had, I know I was diagnosed 11 and a half years ago. If it's now, I think, uh, you know, uh, the treatment will be much improved. Okay. And, um, and then the other thing I want to say is that uh, just now Dato say uh, that, you know, the gene, gene test is about 2000 something. No, actually you can get it for 1005 in a cancer research uh, uh, Malaysia. And that one is located on the first floor in Subang Jaya Hospital. So you can get your gene test, uh, BRCA gene test, uh, and I think about 10 more genes. I, I, I've done mine. It only costs, uh, actually it costs 1,500 to donate to the Malaysian uh, Cancer Research. So it's 1,005. And uh, you can have, then you know that uh, whether you have BRCA genes or not. As you heard, that you, once you have BRCA genes, is, uh, the cancer is more nasty and more difficult. But then, of course, you have Oraparib or Olimprasa that can help you, you know, that, uh, to prolong our lives, okay? And uh, now, Dr. Tay also had pointed out that, you know, even your change of lifestyle or, or diet, it, it might be different. Even same people like the Japanese, when they, uh, they, they grow up in, uh, in uh, when they live in Japan, I think uh, the occurrence is, is uh, you know is among the Japanese I think maybe one in forty, and when you go to uh, those there's in, in Hawaii there are a lot of Japanese that one then they fall into the Western lifestyle statistic which one in seven or one in nine, so you see the thing oh because why a lot of beef and all that and uh, you you and 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 compared to what we Asian eat you know less beef and less meat, and we have less posture cancer. So, um, and also I'm a bit shocked, you know, I first, all the time I was being quoting wrongly. I thought, you know, 60% uh, of our Malaysian population when diagnosis was in stage three and stage four. Actually, I was wrong. Actually, I just got it from, I saw it in the, in the chart that uh, really is much higher just on uh, stage four itself is 43%. And then altogether, I think stage three and four is about 70%. It's very high. So we have to encourage people to have early, you know, early detection of posture cancer. Uh, to that, I think, um, I think the uh, Only Man Can in Initiative together with new MMC they are going to embark a, a quite a comprehensive uh, pump, a PSA test for for Malaysian public and uh, many through the GPs and all. And uh, we hope that with that effort, uh, they can uh, lower down the percentage of the incidence of stage three and four. Okay, and um, we'd like to congratulate uh, Dr. Tay for successfully, you know, getting the new uh, Da Vinci machine. My gosh, I was so sad when Dr. Tay told me last, I heard from Dr. Tay that they are going to scrape the robotic uh, machine there. I said, oh my gosh, there's only one in, uh, in the East Coast, East of Malaysia. And uh, we, we also fought very hard to retain the one in HUK, H, HKL. And finally, you know, at a the time, they managed to get it. So I said, oh my gosh, I don't think uh, Sarawak can get it. But eventually, you guys are going to get it, which is very, very good news. Yeah. Actually, for 10 million, maybe, you know, we should lobby some of the rich guy to uh, get more 
you know, Da Vinci, you know, install maybe in Penang, or something like that, who are another population center. And uh, so that we have, uh, we train more people, more urologists to be ex expert in all this because it's so difficult to perfect your skill in the robotic surgery and you have to, to, to operate a lot and uh, intensive training. Okay. Um, and uh, for, we are also very thankful for the, uh, for the PSMA warriors. One of them, of course, there are two of them, two of the three here, you know. We have uh, Pato Ibrahim, another big warrior. And then uh, now we have uh, Dr. Ng, and then of course we have Linkin Swaran. These three guys are the pioneers and warriors for PSMA because there's no many centers, you know, doing the PSMA. I, I was so excited when, when, when Tato Ibrahim, I read in the newspaper, introduced the PSMA into Malaysia. And it is at least two or three years before Singapore got his. Yes. You see, we were in front of that. I can tell you, PSMA is, is a, some sort of breakthrough technology. You know, I went for treatment in UK and US. And when I took my PSMA scan there, they didn't know how to use it. Why? Because the NHS don't have money. And, uh, and uh, not many, you know, uh, because it was, uh, I think, uh, correct me when I'm wrong, this is very widely promoted for PSMA was in Europe and Australia. You see, when I went to, uh, you know, uh, Peter McCallan, they said, oh, they're very familiar with that. But anyway, uh, so work very hard on it, uh, Dr. Ng and uh, try to get uh, really, uh, I hope your statement is true, that uh, you try to promote, insist that really, before you do your PS biopsies, try to get a PSMA. See where the PIRAT score is and you're more accurate. I'm, I'm so sorry for <laughs> Dr. Tay. I think uh, you have still not, don't have a PSMA center in, uh, in Sarawak, right? So maybe there's a good project for you to work on, you know, Dr. Tay. You know, get uh, those guys instead of flying all over here. In fact, uh, just recently, uh, one of our guys from uh, Sarawak just flew over here. I think he's one of your your, your guys. And uh, for for a scan, my gosh, all the way here, and the poor guy fighting like hell to get a PSMA scan. And just lately got a scan in ICANN. I think the <laughs> doctor knows who we see. Uh, I think the guy is Tan. I think maybe he's here. Oh no, he's in KL now. Actually, he's still wandering around in KL. Anyway, um, then the other thing, of course, uh, we are encouraged by, you know, saying that, you know, you, uh, you might be able to speed up your actinum 177, huh? uh, lutetium 177, your actinum 225. You get it in and uh, so your alpha particle is stronger and uh, we have a more successful outcome because at this moment in time, as I heard from you, uh, you know, the, the live prolongation of uh, using lutinium uh, statistically is still not that long. I think if you can perfect the treatment. I think the, uh, the treatment is good because uh, I was very excited when my daughter, my daughter is also a, a nuclear medicine. He was here a nuclear medicine in Dudley Hospital in Birmingham. And, uh, and she said, that, uh, Dad, I'm very, very, uh, I must tell you, you know, uh, we are going to get this PSMA soon. And uh, next time you come here, you know, you can be treated. I said, no, no, I, I, I think it's only according to what we know is the, the medicine of last resort. That means you have finished everything. I'm not, not very far from there yet. <laughs> so so uh, she was very excited. He said, no, don't worry, come, come. But okay. Um, yeah, Dr. Uh, Tay, you know, you can work in Tarawak Singh, PSMA before biopsies so that you can get another. So those guys of your people and Sabah need not to fly over here, you know? No, and I can there's only one. Why don't we get more? Hey, uh, doc, 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 get more, please. Go and get one in Penang at least, you know. Okay. With your society support. Oh yeah, we will fight. We will fight like hell. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, I think um, there is a there's a great potential in this taranostic uh, treatment, you know. So we hope that it will uh, progress. Like it, it will hope it is a breakthrough, you know. And um, 
Yeah, I think uh, I learned a lot. I think uh, I hope you guys, uh, you know, learn a lot. And uh, if uh, now actually is uh, 10 minutes to five, we have taken a, a whole beautiful Sunday afternoon. And uh, if you get, you guys can unmute yourself. All of you unmute yourself. And lastly, we give a big round of applause to three of uh, us. Mr. Wong, Mr. Wong. Stay. Yes, sir. Mr. Wong. Hey, Dr. Lawrence, Mr. go ahead. Dr. Lawrence, uh, go ahead. Uh, can, can I ask uh, Dr. Hung, uh, okay. Lutetium 177, can it for other type of treatment, other type of cancer treatment? It's, uh, hey, Dr. Mm, your Lutetium 177 can go for other cancer or not? Yes, uh, at, at this current moment, the established one is for neuroendocrine uh, tumor, in which uh, we have... Uh, we have uh, to use it for the last five to six years for neuroendocrine tumor for this current moment. Okay, okay. I think uh, I think Thank we have, uh, as I said, we have uh, we have holding backs all our uh, doctors, and uh, Sunday is really a family day. Actually, this, uh, these guys are very very busy. I know. All right, hey, can you?